from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Good. Um, I'm Jennifer Manning. I'm a librarian with the Congressional Research Service here at the library. Um, on behalf of Native American employees and friends at the Library of Congress, I'd like to welcome you to this Native American Heritage Month event. Thank you for coming and celebrating with us on this rather gloomy day. Um, we have a full day ahead of us, so without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce the library's chief of staff, Mr. Robert Newland. Well, thank you and good morning. Um, I have been uh, Chief of Staff here at the library uh, for just about one year. In fact, I've, I'm celebrating several anniversaries um, in the past week. I've been Chief of Staff for a year and I celebrated my 40th um, anniversary of employment with the Library of Congress. And I could thank you. <laughs> Yes, I know it's amazing that I'm still standing. Um, but it's a wonderful institution and a wonderful place to have a career. And um, I'm really looking forward to you learning more about um, our many resources today. Um, one thing I should note, too, is um, this is my maiden voyage using an iPad for my remarks. But um, the uh, acting Librarian of Congress, David Mao, uses one all the time, and he's very facile with it. So I've seen him speak enough, and I kind of got jealous. <laughs> and I thought, well, he's making me look like a troglodyte, so I'm going to do it. But I just want you to know that I'm also carrying the paper copy in my back <laughs> pocket, because you never know. But it is my pleasure to uh, welcome you to the Library of Congress and today's program showcasing three LC programs and your opportunity to connect with our collections that showcase the great heritage of American Indians who have lived on this land for thousands and thousands of years. The library, as you probably know, has over, um, there I just did it, has um, over 15 million items in all formats. Uh, we acquire them, we prepare them, we organize them, and we preserve them. Today's theme is connecting American Indian and federal libraries. And our goal for you in the audience, whether you're listening online or viewing this through a webcast, is to learn about Native American research and resources at the Library of Congress. Um, but I hope you will also get to know one of our greatest treasures here at the library, um, and that is the Library of Congress staff. Uh, they have incredible knowledge of our collections and are here to help you navigate uh, this marvelous institution. You'll find lots of people like me that have been here 35, 40, 45 years. And sometimes at, at this stage, I think it takes that long to, get, to really get to know the Library of um, Congress collections. And when I look around this room, I see so many talented people, Beecher, uh, Yolanda, Blaine, Jennifer, Eric, all people who have incredible knowledge of this great institution. So today, please, please take advantage of them. And I know they'll all share their emails with you. Um, today we're going to have presentations from three major programs that further our work with American Indians. In just a few moments, we'll learn about the work of uh, the FedLink American Library Initiative. At noon, a former Kluge scholar and a panel of cultural experts will talk about federal and regional Native history. And at 2 p.m., the Law Library will present the Indigenous 
tri uh, tribal law portal, which is available online. And in between, you'll be seeing presentations from our curators, from the Geography and Map Division, from prints and photographs, from manuscripts, and from rare books. What we're hoping is, is that what you find here today will whet your appetite to keep coming back again and again. We also hope that it will um, help you find a place to expand and deepen um, your understanding of Native American, American Indian, and indigenous peoples of the world who link us to a great past and to a great future. We invite you to continue learning about our cooperative web portal, NativeAmericanHeritageMonth.com. I think I got that right. So with that said, it is really my pleasure to welcome you here. And um, anything we can do to make your visit uh, more enjoyable, please let us know. Um, I'm hoping to come in and out of the program today. Uh, I feel like I'm on the lecture circuit. I'm going directly from here to talk to a um, management group about our uh, strategic plan. Trust me, I'd rather be here. <laughs> so with that, thank you so much. Okay, let's see here. All right. Unfortunately, I don't have an iPad yet. I am keeping my fingers crossed for Christmas, but uh, <laughs> we shall see what happens. So I'm doing this the old-fashioned way. Uh, my name is George Francois. I'm the director of the Department of the Interior Library here in Washington, D.C. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Department of the Interior Library and the Tribal College and University Library Initiative that we are very much involved with. So first, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Department of the Interior Library. We are located, again, here in Washington, D.C., in the Stuart Lee Udall Department of the Interior Building, 1849 C Street Northwest, room 2262. We are open to the public. We're open from 7.45 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday, except for federal holidays. We will be closed tomorrow for Veterans Day. We do provide interlibrary loan services. Um, we both uh, lend things out to other libraries around the country, and it doesn't matter, public libraries, university libraries, corporate libraries, we will loan things out to you that um, are circulating materials. Um, and we, of course, um, process interlibrary loan requests for our own staff as well. Our website is www.doi.gov slash library. We've got a lot of great resources on our website, including a lot of great Native American resources on our website. So we invite you to take a look at that site for information about the Department of the Interior, our library, and Native American resources. Now, currently, our library is in the midst of a two-year modernization slash renovation project. So we're actually operating out of a much smaller temporary library right now. Most of, our, um, most of our popular legal, legislative, and reference materials are located in our temporary library, but um, about 90 to 95 percent of our materials right now are located in an off-site warehouse in Sterling, Virginia. We do have a courier service that goes back and forth twice a week so that if we need materials from the warehouse, we can get them pulled. And um, we are, like I said, scheduled to reopen probably late 2016, early 2017. Some of our facilities people are telling me it could be as early as next October, but I am not holding my breath on that one, knowing our facilities people at DOI. So uh, we shall see what happens there as well. We've got about a one million volume collection altogether. Things that we collect um, include materials published by all the DOI bureaus, offices, and agencies as well as commercial publications that have subject areas that, um, that deal with Department of the Interior issues. So we collect things from all of our bureaus. Like I said, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, we collect a lot of materials from. National Park Service, Bureau of Land Management, Bureau of Reclamation, Fish and Wildlife Service, USGS, several others as well. And 
it's not just BIA that produces materials that deal with Native American issues. Um, all of the agencies within the Department of the Interior, to one extent or another, have materials that they publish that deal with Native American heritage, history, um, current events that uh, Native Americans are involved with, et cetera. So almost everything in our collection in one way or another touches the Native American community. We, um, we also have a legal and administrative collection that includes, includes bureau and agency directives and orders, secretarial orders, and executive orders and proclamations. And again, many of these items also contain materials related to Native American affairs. So how did this whole um, movement to try to help Native American libraries and specifically tribal college and university libraries get started? It, it basically had its genesis back in 2002 with Executive Order Number 13270, July 3rd, 2002, entitled Tribal Colleges and Universities. And this said each participating executive department and agency is to develop plans that would address how the agency intends to increase the capacity of tribal colleges to compete effectively for any available grants, contracts, cooperative agreements, and any other federal resources and to encourage tribal colleges to participate in federal programs. The plans also may emphasize access to high quality educational opportunities for economically disadvantaged Indian students, consistent with the requirements of the No Child Left Behind Act of 2001. So at this point, what happened was organizations such as the Institute for Museum and Library Services placed an increased emphasis on providing grants and other opportunities to tribal college and university libraries. The Bureau of Indian Education within the Department of the Interior began to work a little bit more closely with tribal college and university libraries and the American Indian Higher Education Consortium also started to work a little more closely with tribal colleges and universities on mutually beneficial projects. The one thing, though, that was going on at that time was a um, case called the Cobell case, and I think many of you might be familiar with that case where um, Native American tribes were suing the Department of the Interior for mishandling Indian trust funds. So there was a, a high degree at that point of mistrust between Native American tribes and the Department of the Interior. And not as much really got done on this front as we would have hoped to have gotten done at that point. So because of the suspicions that existed between the Department of the Interior and a lot of Native American tribes, a lot of these, a lot of these um, initiatives, unfortunately, were put off a little bit at that time. So we fast forward to February 14th, 2011. Valentine's Day, which is a great day for a memorandum of understanding, of course. Um, so an MOU was signed between the Bureau of Indian Ed Education and the American Indian Higher Education Consortium. By February 14th of 2011, the Cobell case had been settled. And um, the suspicions, while they were still there a little bit, a lot of those suspicions and a lot of the mistrust had kind of evaporated as a result of the settlement being reached. So the, memora the Memorandum of Understanding stated that DOI and AHIC will focus on strengthening the capability, the capacities of TCUs and supporting their full integration into DOI's programs and services. This MOU will also promote enriching outdoor experiences and law enforcement and natural resources and other science and technology career pathways among students attending TCUs and their future K-12 schools. A part of the initiative, a part of this memorandum of understanding also was to fully integrate TCUs into DOI mission areas and bureau programs, services, and resource opportunities, and provide linkage and develop partnerships between TCUs and DOI bureaus and offices. Um, part of what happened as a result, let me go back here, as a result of this as well, is that the Department of the Interior Library was brought into the process. 
and asked, how can the Department of the Interior Library participate and contribute to this initiative, to this MOU that was signed in 2011? And this is when we first heard about getting started with this particular initiative. Soon thereafter, December 2nd, 2011, an executive order was signed, improving American Indian and Alaska Native educational opportunities and strengthening tribal colleges and universities. And what this did was this established a formal White House initiative on American Indian and Alaska Native education. The Secretary of Education and the Secretary of the Interior were co-chairs, are our co-chairs of the initiative. Missions of the initiative serve as liaison with other executive branch agencies on American Indian and Alaska Native issues and advise those agencies on how they might help promote American Indian and Alaska Native educational opportunities. Further tribal sovereignty by supporting efforts consistent with a applicable law to build the capacity of tribal educational agencies and TCUs to provide a high quality education, education services to American Indian and Alaska Native children and increase college access and, competition and completion for American Indian Alaska Native students through strategies to strengthen the capacity of TCUs. So in early 2002, the Bureau of Indian Education within DOI met with representatives of other DOI bureaus and agencies to discuss how we can best go about doing this. Um, the, the Office of the Secretary again asked DOI's library to help participate in this and asked if we can expand our services and outreach to, T to TCUs through their libraries. Now, of course, our budget is not, is not such that we could expand our budget too dra dramatically to help with this sort of effort. So it had to, be, had to be something that we could do that wouldn't necessarily cost a lot of money to the library or to the Department of the Interior. A lot of ideas were presented to TCU presidents, and there was a lot of interest within the TCU community in the library services assistance to their own libraries and their own library communities. So at that point, we got together with AHIC and discussed what the best way to start this project would be. So we, um, we received a list of libraries and library leaders at 37 AHIC member libraries and sent out a survey to all of them, asking them a number of different questions. They included questions about high-speed internet access in their library and on campus, electronic databases and ebook subscriptions in their library, whether or not they had interlibrary loan services, whether or not they received government documents through the GPO's Federal Depository Library Program. And we asked them about other items, services, and resources that they felt they needed to provide quality services to their students and staff. We received responses from 19 AHEC member libraries as a result of that survey. And some of the things that, um, that they told us were that they needed additional staffing they needed additional funding to purchase more resources. They need additional funding to offset the increasing prices of databases and print materials. They would like consortium pricing for databases and integrated library systems. They were interested in interlibrary loan reciprocal lending agreements and a possible TCU interlibrary loan consortium. They wanted more computers in their libraries. They wanted the means to be able to promote library services and resources. They needed better transportation to TCU libraries that weren't centrally located within their communities. They needed additional training for library staff and students in online databases. And many of them needed additional or even adequate space for their libraries with new furniture. Some of the things that the Department of the, Department of the Interior Library took out of that as far as things we would be able to provide the TCU libraries as a result of their survey included reciprocal interlibrary loan services where we would encourage TCU libraries to borrow circulating materials from our collection, 
reference services where we would encourage TCU students and faculty to contact our library for any reference assistance in instances where they couldn't necessarily um, have the resources to answer those questions themselves. Government document assistance, encouraging TCU libraries to contact the DOI library for assistance in locating and obtaining federal government documents, especially documents that um, were originated by the Department of the Interior. And remote online access to library classes. The, the DOI library uh, promotes and hosts a lot of training classes and other types of programs. And we wanted to encourage them to uh, be able to attend our classes via webinar or some other remote means. So what we did is we presented all of these ideas at a FedLink meeting soon thereafter. And we found that FedLink was also very much interested in helping us with this project and promoting this project to other FedLink member libraries. And we were very pleased to hear that and very pleased at the response from many FedLink libraries as they also expressed their interest in joining with us on this project and soon thereafter the American Indian Library Initiative working group here at the Department of, uh, here at the Fed, at FedLink was um, indeed formed and, um, and continues to this day. So with that I will turn things over to Gary McCone and Gary is um, with the American Indian Higher Education Consortium, and he will tell you a little bit more about AHEC's involvement in this project. Thank you very much. Well, this is going to be really short because George just gave my speech, <laughs> and so. It's more dramatic with paper, I don't know where Robert is, but if you try doing this with an iPad, it costs you a lot of money, so don't do that. Um, I am Gary McCohen, I'm with AHEC. I sh maybe I should mention, I'm a volunteer. They don't pay me, but it's so much fun, so I do it anyway. Um, American Indian, I don't have to explain what AHEC is. No, because you already know this. Thank you, George. All this detail, I can skip about 20 slides now and go right into, in case you don't know, I think George said he met, there were 37 at the time. I think there's 38 now. The Pawnee Nation College has just come on board. Uh, basically, they're out in the West, as, as you might maybe suspect or maybe not suspect. But they are scattered around essentially the mountain states, a couple in the Southwest. The oldest one, is Diné College down in Arizona. It was formed in 1968. The newest one I think was last week, Pawnee Nation College. And th there are a couple of others out there that are in the process of getting together, getting facilities, getting accreditation. And then once they get accreditation, then they can apply and be part of AHEC if they want to. And most of them want to. There seems to be a, a genuine benefit uh, to them for being in AHEC. So, I think, it, okay, I like this. Depends on what version of PowerPoint you use, whether your pictures are in the right places or not. <laughs> so we do have curriculum support, which is a good thing. <laughs> and Native Studies Call. So, so those are two really important issues. Uh, underfunded, I just put that in because Everybody is underfunded. Tribal colleges and universities are really underfunded. The, the size of the, well, the size of the collection, I mean, I've heard from people who are just starting out who have, well, we have a bookcase, but we don't have any bookcases, book, books on it. So that's one level. And you have other ones that have maybe a 50,000 item collection, something like that. So I'm not counting microfiche and all these things that librarians like to count to get their statistics up but real books. They do get funding. The colleges, I should say, get funding from the federal government based on enrollment, FTE enrollment. Uh, and so there's some fudging of statistics, I think, on everybody's side when they start counting this. If they have to pay for something, then they want their enrollment low. 
like if you have 2,000 users on a database, that gets you one price. If you have 5,000, that's a different price. But it also affects the amount of money you receive from the federal government. A lot of people think that the tribal colleges, because all but three of them are on reservation land, and everyone knows reservations all have casinos, and so there's lots of money. And there's probably a lot of money, but you'd be surprised how little of it goes to the education system on the reservations. Uh, curriculum support. I think there's a T hiding back there. <coughs> Many of the libraries don't have a materials budget that allows them to buy anything other than strict curriculum related materials. They can't branch out and buy other things. They can't uh, get supporting materials. They can't, uh, they just can't do much other than this very specifically support the curriculum, which, which really limits the size of the, of the collection and the use of it. Almost all of them claim to have or try to have a native studies collection. Some of them have, I think, really good native studies collections. Uh, Dene has a really good one. I think uh, Little Bighorn has a really good Native Studies collection. But for the most part, they try. Most of them also serve as a public library. So when you can't buy books except for curriculum, that really limits the public library aspect of it. They serve preschool to elders, not just people who are enrolled in the college. So that's an issue. Digital resources, uh, George mentioned a number of different, I guess on the survey that they, well he didn't give statistics on who had what, but and a lot of them do have digital resources. And it's sort of interesting because I've tried to get different consortium pricing on different collections of electronic journals or databases. And it's interesting because, of course, all of the vendors are willing to give me a price. But the problem is that a lot of these colleges, depending on what state they're in, they already get a good deal within the state. Minnesota or Wyoming or somebody like that, the state pays for it. They don't have to pay anything to get into this uh, consortium. Other ones provide an entryway into the consortium, but they have to pay really a reduced rate. And so that's great for the ones that have that kind of an arrangement, but it seems that most states don't do that. You're on your own. You aren't in, either there isn't a state consortium or there is one, but you can't get in unless you pay a full percentage or a, a full ticket. So that's an issue. And when I get a, con a consortial price for all 37 or 38, often the ones that are getting the really good deal so it makes no sense for us to get into this because we're already getting it more cheaply. And so almost every one of those has fallen through just because of that. When I go back to ProQuest or whoever and say, well, okay, how about for this many? So well, then the price per institution goes up, as you would expect. I mean, they're in it to make money. Okay. Um, the great book giveaway. This is something that been going on for a, lot of, a long time now, and here's pictures from, th this is something that in conjunction with surplus books programs here at the Library of Congress, National Museum of American Indian, uh, I've gotten books from DC chapter of the Special Libraries Association, from Fannie Mae, from Department of Education, and individuals uh, Maryland a chapter of Mensa, they've all shipped in books to, uh, to go out to, the, to these colleges. So every year we send out about, uh, National Agricultural Library I should mention, since they pay the shipping bill for all the books. Uh, I send out a list four times a year maybe and let them pick the titles they want. So they don't get ones, they, it's not just here's a bunch of books because that doesn't work. They pick the titles, I send them out, and they get what they want. And so that's sort of a fun thing that they, that they like to do. Uh, I think maybe, when you can see from, see from the pictures, there's really a wide range, I think, of, 
I guess what I'd say is, <clears throat> look at the pictures. They just look like libraries. They're not any different from any other public library, mainly. Uh, there are certainly some things that, that cater to a, a, a pre-K crowd that you can see. But they're, they're basically just like any other, any other library that you'd, that you'd think about, except for the staffing can run from one part-time person to maybe, and that's a number of them. Or they can get a student help maybe sometimes. I don't know what the, I'm gonna say that the, if you look at, some of them have multiple branches. So if you exclude the multiple branches libraries, I say the most staff that any of them have is probably six. And I may be way off, but I can't be off by more than six. So, um, so that's basically it. And, and I thank George for giving such a great background on AHEC's involvement in all these things because frankly, I didn't know any of this stuff. And so now I'll be able to look at his slides and learn it all. Okay, and now I would like to introduce my twin for the day, <laughs> Blaine Desi, Acting Executive Director of FedLink, who I have known for several years now. And I, and I will let you get up here so we can thank you. you notice we all got, the, we both got the memo. Exactly, exactly. Twins separated at birth. Exactly, there you go. Thank you. Let me just, okay. I think I can do this. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Library of Congress, and welcome to this program. Uh, I am Blaine Desi. I'm the acting executive director of FedLink for another few days when we will be welcoming a new director to FedLink, and I will ensure that one of her priorities is to continue work on this project. But let me try and put some of these puzzle pieces together, especially for those of you who are not familiar with the government as such. So earlier we heard George talk about the efforts of the Department of the Interior, great efforts. And we've just heard Gary talk about the efforts of IHEC, did I pronounce that correctly? AHEC. AHEC, I'm sorry. And I'm here to talk a little bit about FedLink. And so what is FedLink? FedLink is, no, is the Federal Library and Information Network. It's an organization of federal agencies working together to achieve optimum use of the resources and facilities of federal libraries and information centers. I'm not going to read the slide for you word for word. But here's what I, I, I want to bring to your attention. I don't think many people realize the power and the impact that federal libraries could have on this particular issue. Uh, when we have tried to do a survey of all the federal libraries, we've determined that there are probably at least 1,500 federal libraries around the world, if not closer to 2,000. Right. So if you look at this as some sort of a government enterprise, this is the largest library structure in the world, in the history of man, for that matter. I mean, that's quite impressive when you begin to think about the power of that many libraries focusing on a particular issue. It, it, it's, it's re it really sort of staggers the imagination. And so, what I keep wanting to impress upon people is that taken collectively, federal libraries can make a huge impact in terms of services, in terms of resources, in terms of education to the American people. You know, um, Gary just said that many of the libraries that he works with are like public libraries. Many of the libraries that are in the federal government are like public libraries. George works in what is, in effect, a public library. The Library of Congress, I mention this and people always kind of shudder when I say this, the Library of Congress is a public library. Just like the National Library of Medicine, just like the National Agricultural Library, 
And if we could really harness all this library energy or all this intellectual energy to work with tribal colleges and universities or tribal nations, I think there could be huge impacts. So I guess what I'm, I'm really saying is I'm committed to working with federal libraries through FedLink. And if you're in this room, I'm hoping that you would also sort of commit to that cause <laughs> with us, that the power of all of us to work together can be really quite significant. So that's my soapbox, and now I'll move on to other things. So how did FedLink, which is this, con this organization, really um, put tribal colleges and universities on its radar screen? Well, it really began back in 2012 when George Francois, and let me, let me say George is too modest to say this, but he has been one of the driving forces behind this entire effort. So George will never tell you that, but much of this would not have happened without George's direct involvement. So kudos to George. Uh, the Department of the Interior approached the FedLink uh, Advisory Board to talk about what could be done. George shared with us the results of the survey, and he was particularly interested in FedLink's ability to negotiate consortium pricing for services. And we have some legal issues with that that we're trying to resolve because tribal nations are not considered part of the federal government even though they receive federal funding but anyway but we well, there are other things that we can be thinking about too as in education and collaboration and resource sharing and when george brought this notion to to my advisory board which is comprised of other federal agencies everyone was very very supportive of the idea and they felt that yes we as a federal library community do want to have a responsibility in improving the lives of students and faculty at those tribal institutions, that, that we can really make a contribution, especially since so many of us already have a public mission to begin with, that we have no reason not to make an effort to extend our services and resources to those, to those tribal members. And so that began in 2012. And then um, we also began to work with one of our favorite external organizations, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, now, which is known as IMLS. IMLS is, and Mary Alice might tell you this, is a federal organization which awards grants to public schools and other types of libraries around the United States, not federal libraries. We have a very clear delineation between the two. But my contention is that because so many federal libraries have a public library or a school library purpose, there are there are areas of common interest between what we're attempting to do in the federal government and what IMLS is trying to do for the United States. And so we decided to put together a program in 2014, American Indian Libraries Making Connections, to highlight the stories of five recent IMLS library grant recipients. This program was a huge success by all accounts. And it was really because of the efforts of Terry DeVoe, who was sitting here, and also her colleague, Mary Alice Ball, who's sitting next to her. But this was really our first foray into a kind of programming that shows we can work across boundaries to, to illustrate the issue and to talk about solutions to those, to those issues. So we were very proud of that. And when we saw the kind of response that we got, we, this just fueled us to continue to discuss what we might do in the federal library community. So at this point, we decided, well, we've done enough talking. We've done enough thinking. We, we've experimented with some programs. Let's do, let's do something a little more formal as a federal library community. And think of this as a community, not just 
the Library of Congress. This is a community. We decided to create what we, what we normally do, a working group, which is how we work within our community, called ALLY, which is the American Indian Library Initiative, as a way to focus our efforts to, to really work with tribal colleges and universities and tribal nations because we also realize there are information needs outside of colleges and universities, but to really work with a group of federal libraries to bring improvements. I hope that doesn't sound too um, judgmental. To sort of work with native communities to improve their library resources and initiatives. So we have created this standing working group that meets regularly and several people here are involved in that. And the goals were really um, quite straightforward but ambitious and that is to build an information culture from local to local and local to national. I think part of our job in FedLink is always to be raising awareness and to be advocating for issues we need to become better advocates for the idea that we in the federal government can provide direct support to these constituencies. We need to make that a priority and we need to keep talking about it. So that's, that's one thing that we need to do. We wanted to ident or create a clearinghouse of resources. What does George have in his institution that could be of benefit to this community? What does the Library of Congress have? I used to be at the Department of Justice. What do they have that could be of benefit to these communities? And again, when you think that we have over a thousand libraries that cover every disciplinary area you can imagine, that list of resources could be phenomenal if we could really get that captured and then make it available to these communities. We also wanted to work with American Indian communities in areas like preservation, digitization, cataloging. I recently went to uh, the ATOM conference, and there's a great deal of interest among the, the native communities about preserving their own cultures. I mean, that just makes sense. Preserving their own language, their own artifacts, their own culture. And so for them, preservation, uh, digitization, where possible or, or necessary, cataloging becomes extremely important to them as they, as they really strive to ensure that their culture remains alive for generations to come. And so that's another area where we could really help these, these communities. Training opportunities, well, look around you. We, we've got a room full of cameras. We could use this same technology to work with those communities. You know, we're already out broadcasting. We could certainly tailor some training efforts. In fact, let, you know, let's work on that. I like this idea. It just dawned on me. We should do a series of webinars targeted ex primarily to the tribal colleges and universities. Maybe we could do that together. That's you, IMLS. <laughs> In case you're wondering who I'm pointing at, it's the IMLS people. And Gary, you... Sure. No. No, sometimes I just have an idea and I have to just say it to see how it sounds. But I think we could do that. Uh, we do lots of training anyway. Why couldn't we expand that and really think about how to move this training out to, our, to, the, to the native communities? And also promote existing federal resources in legal and STEM knowledge collection of value to American Indian libraries. STEM is the rage, uh, and of course we know the libraries, as Gary has told us, are underfunded, understaffed, um, they're weak in resources. So what if we could bring the power of these 1,500 libraries to those libraries in terms of STEM? How remarkable would that be? And later you'll be hearing about the legal resources, because we have Yolanda Goldberg here from the Law Library who is doing tremendous work with her colleagues to create a law portal for Native American law. So we'll be paying a little more attention to that this afternoon. 
And that's really what I have to say. So let me, again, let me just reiterate, <laughs> not to put too fine a point on it. Federal libraries represent the largest collection of intellectual resources the world has ever seen. When we gathered up bibliographic records from other libraries in the federal government, we gathered 30 million bibliographic records. There is no library system in the world that has 30 million bibliographic records. How do we take that and how do we take all the people that support that and begin to really make it available to some of the people who need it the most? And that's the challenge that FedLink has in front of it. So thank you very much. And I will now turn the floor over to Mary Alice Ball, our wonderful colleague from the Institute for Museum and Library Services. Mary Alice, welcome. Good morning, everyone. I'm really delighted to be here today to talk to you about the Institute of Museum and Library Services and what we are doing to support tribal libraries, uh, whatever the level of clientele that they are serving. I, I'll start just by saying we are one of the three cultural heritage uh, agencies within the federal government. The National Endowment for the Arts, National Endowment for the Humanities are better known than IMLS. And I like to say we are the little engine that could. We really try to make a difference, and I feel like we are making a difference on tribal lands. But before I go there, I, I wanted to mention that related to the work that we are doing, um, and, and this is both on the library side in the Office of Library Services and on the museum side in the Office of Museum Services and in our policy research and evaluation department where we are putting uh, survey research out all the time. We have within um, OLS, Library Services, we have two strategic priorities. And when Blaine, uh, Gary, and George were talking, I thought how I think these are things that people might want to know about. We um, have two priorities, one being the national digital platform, and the other being learning in libraries, which includes a STEM. But particularly, National Digital Platform, what we are doing through our grant making is funding initiatives that will provide the broadest range of resources, whatever format those are in, um, and it, it do it in a way that is, is free or um, really open, open access. And so we've funded projects with the Digital Public Library of America, with Internet Archive, with Hathi Trust, with many academic institutions. And I'll talk about them a little bit at the end. Um, but I thought those are things I encourage you to go to our website, to imls.gov, and look at our grant opportunities. You can search awarded grants. And sometimes that's a good way to start if you're not sure of um, what type of idea you should come to us with. It can help to re read through what we have funded already. I have my email address on here, so uh, if you do have questions, I'm thinking about folks that are out there um, in cyberspace today. Um, please feel free to drop me a line. So I thought I would start by talking about our Native American Library Services basic grants. These are non-competitive grants, and they're designed to support uh, existing library operations and really to support those core library services and uh, collections. And um, there is a broad, we interpret those core, core services very broadly. And so it might be for um, building a collection of resources for young children, uh, you know, pre-K literacy types of things. Or it could be uh, elder resources, working with elders. And uh, we funded things with um, uh, programs where teens are working with elders. So there is a wide range, but it can also go to things like 
a dehumidifier, um, bookshelves, tables. The, we interpret this very broadly. It is a small grant. So this one-year grant is $6,000, and uh, you can get an extra $1,000 for an educational option. And that is education or assessment. So someone can use it to go to a conference. They can use it to hire a consultant to work with them. Um, there is no cost share required for this. And it is available to any federally recognized tribe uh, or Native Alaskan uh, village or corporation. We fund roughly, I think, somewhere around 220, 240 um, federally recognized tribes right now out of uh, possible 567. We're waiting. I'm looking forward to talking to the uh, representative from the Pamunkey tribe later today because we can start funding them too. We also have uh, a Native American Library Services Enhancement Grant. And so this is really to push out, be more innovative in terms of the services, the programming that these libraries are doing. It can be about workforce development, anything people come to us with. Language revitalization, digital literacy skills, uh, cultural heritage preservation. Again, for tribes that are so um, challenged by circumstances of society around them, this funding can be really critical uh, to help them preserve. Uh, we've got a lot of people right now that are working on preserving their language. And they come to us and, um, you know, they've got five, five speakers uh, who are of the language. And they're worried because they know they could disappear quickly. So we see the urgency of this funding for tribes. Again, it's uh, relatively small compared to some of our other grant programs, but there's a ceiling of $150,000. And that's up to two years, although it could just be a year. Again, cost share is not required. It is cut off. Again, this, it talks about eligibility. And if you go to our website, you can find the full details there of eligibility. But any federally recognized tribe or Alaska village or corporation uh, is eligible to apply. Thank you. Um, we have our, our 2015 fiscal year budget was just over uh, three million eight hundred thousand uh, dollars we've requested four million uh, in our 2016 budget so we'll see how that works out but if we look at how it's divided down it's there is just one bucket of money and uh, due to the forethought of senator daniel in a way uh, there is a percentage and it comes out right now to be roughly just over five hundred and fifty thousand dollars for Native Hawaiian grants. And that usually comes out to be maybe somewhere in the range of three to five grantees. Our Native American basic grants, um, the, uh, it's non-competitive, as I said earlier. Everybody gets a piece. It just depends on how many tribes apply. Uh, this last year, it came out to roughly 1.4 million for 220 grantees. And then the leftover, the remainder of that funding is what we use to fund the Native American Enhancement Awards. And last year that turned out to be $1.8 million. Uh, it generally, we fund somewhere in the range of 10 to 15 grants with that funding. We also, and, and I think um, it's something that I'm proudest of for the agency, that we move beyond our, the, the funding that's designated for tribal libraries to fund programs from other uh, sources, from our National Leadership Grant Program and from the Laura Bush 21st Century Librarian Program. 
The second uh, has to deal with education and recruitment into the profession. National Leadership Grant or programs of national scope, more innovative. So we fund um, the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums. I think many of you went to the ATOM conference this last September. And we fund the workshops um, that we see as really critical for the continuing education and professional development of tribal librarians, who, as we've heard, you know, it may be a one-person shop. Um, we, we do allow them to use their funds to hire substitutes so that the library doesn't have to close when they go off to a conference. We um, fund scholarships. Susan Feller, the CEO of ATOM, is very convincing. So each year she comes back and says, well, we need a little bit more. Can you give us a supplement? Because we need more scholarships. And this year I think we gave an extra $75,000. In the world of grant making, $75,000 is chump change, but for that tribal librarian who wants to come from, you know, upper Montana or something, it's huge. Um, we also fund, funded uh, and will fund a, next, a subsequent survey, but a study that ATOM did of digital inclusion in native communities. And this is a report. You can find it on the ATOM website. It was uh, huge, I would say, in informing the Federal Communications Commission and the Department of Commerce's National Telecommunications Information Administration about the situation on tribal lands in terms of um, broadband access, adoption, um, digital literacy skills, all these issues around digital inclusion. We have also funded a project that came out of Washington State University called Mukatu, uh, which is an indigenous uh, New Zealand or Australian indigenous word. Um, we funded them to the tune of $1.4 million. And we funded the development of this open source platform that there are a lot of, or, or certainly we're not, uh, we don't see a paucity of cultural heritage tools that are out there. But this is a tool that was made for indigenous communities. And so it understands that not everything needs to be made publicly accessible. That uh, Native nations have uh, the need and the right to say, we want to restrict these materials. Only a man should see them, only a woman should see them, only an elder should see them, only a tribal member, regardless of where that tribal member may be, because we know so many tribal members have to go to other places to get jobs. But if they're in LA, they should be able to access a collection that's back, back home in Oklahoma. And we've funded quite a bit of training around this. We've, we're continuing. There's a second cohort of six tribes, two people from each tribe, that is just being formed. And uh, these people will learn how to use the tools. And, and um, some are already coming to us to get funding to, for the technology. Um, and, they, and I should also say they're developing a kit uh, that will be used and to help train and support people in this. This last year we gave a, a grant to Amherst College and it was a collaborative planning grant. They have um, quite a few partners, but we do know and I think they are coming to terms with, maybe because they do have Native American faculty members who are pushing Amherst to think beyond um, just having these holdings and keeping them within their own doors, they want to create a digital atlas of Native American intellectual traditions and build a, a national platform so that all people can see these important, valuable resources that are held and they will be able to see them wherever they are. Um, okay, I'm moving back up because I wrote notes on 
uh, the bottom because I forgot to put on this slide that IMLS also uh, has done a lot of work with, uh, at the behest of the administration in different areas, and I think none that I feel is compelled to talk about as our participation in the President's Broadband Opportunity Council. We have uh, um, highlighted actions that we will take. We also see that um, what other agencies are doing, and we've tried to, um, how shall I say, like insert ourselves in, into their initiatives so that we can disseminate what they are doing to libraries around the country. Um, one of those, I, some of my colleagues here know, I, my proudest accomplishment uh, as being one of the IMLS representatives on that council was the insertion of a comma and the word libraries uh, into a program that General Services Administration is doing with, um, uh, they've refurbished uh, computers. They have a program called Computers for Learning and so they, when they had written up the eligible entities, it was educational institutions or other educational related organizations. And I think oh, those of us in the federal government know that if it isn't clearly spelled out, then it's in doubt. And so we now have inserted in there libraries, that libraries will be able uh, and eligible to get this equipment. The uh, Broadband Opportunity Council came out with a report a couple of months ago. You can find it by Googling White House Broadband Opportunity Council report, and I would encourage you to read it. It has a number of things. Um, I'm concerned about time, so I won't go on. Oh, I have time. Okay, then I will go on. Uh, IMLS has funded two things that we're doing that are already underway. Um, one is a grant to Internet 2. And some of you may know Internet2 is uh, a, a network, an association of these large research and education networks. And we have funded Internet2 to pilot a program where research and education networks will work with uh, tribal and rural, so rural libraries that are not necessarily tribal libraries. And uh, I think it's going to be in five states working with the Research and Education Network in those states to go out and develop a network assessment tool. I mean, on, on tribal lands, broadband itself is, uh, you know, in, in an abysmal state, and we're trying to improve that. But we do know that even in institutions that have broadband, quite often their networks aren't configured properly enough for them to get what they're paying for. And so the development of this sort of tool, we hope will enable people to get higher speed broadband access and then be able to, in, uh, to, to access richer resources online. Um, we are also funding a grant to the chief officers of state library associations. And I, I should say that both of these grants um, are done in partnership with ATOM and with the American Library Association. So I look at two representatives from it here. Um, but the COSLA proposal, and it, and it is underway. Yesterday, Marika Visser uh, had a blog post about the E-rate clearinghouse that has been done by COSLA and the Georgia Public Library Service. And um, E-rate is something we are trying to get more tribal libraries to use. Some are eligible, and yet they may not think they are. So it's definitely worth investigating. Um, we, uh, there is also a training component and a cross-state survey that's being done related to E-rate and E-rate training needs. So those were our contributions to the report where we weren't piggybacking on other agencies like GSA. Last week, the president held a tribal leadership summit. And then on Friday morning, uh, at the very end of that, the Broadband Opportunity Council had a listening session where we listened to tribal leaders. 
talk about the state of broadband out in Native nations and what could be done, what should be done, and challenging us uh, as the federal administration to make a difference. And I think that's all I have to say. Any questions? Gary? Yeah, Oh, yes, sorry, because we do, we fund a lot. So we also fund, uh, and it's Mary Ann Hansen, if you're listening, I'll give a shout out to you, uh, the Tribal College Leadership Institute uh, that we have funded for many, many years out in Bozeman and brings tribal librarians together, uh, tribal college librarians together for leadership training. Any other things that I've forgotten anybody can think of? Another question? Next session. <laughs> no. Okay, we're moving right along. I think we're going to go ahead and get started with this afternoon's programming. My name is George Francois. I'm the director of the Department of the Interior Library. And once again, I want to welcome everyone here to the Library of Congress for our program um, this afternoon. First, our first program is American Indians in the Federal City and Regional History. And we are very pleased to have Joseph Jenatin Palawa here with us this afternoon to, uh, to talk a little bit about, um, the, um, about how Washington, D.C., about American Indians in Washington, D.C., and how, how um, American Indians contributed to the development of this great nation's capital. So with that, Joseph. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, before I say anything else, it's important to acknowledge that as we think and talk together today, we do so not only in the Library of Congress, but on the homelands of the Piscataway Nation and in a, in a broader region that includes the homelands of the Pamunkey and Monacan, Nation, uh, Monacan Nations as well. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I'm excited to be on a panel with Gabby. Tara, Ben, and Karen. I'm excited to hear them talk about their work and activism. I'm up first today because I had the honor of being selected as a John W. Kluge Center Fellow last year to conduct research on my current book project, uh, which is a study of the indigenous histories of Washington, D.C. that I'm calling the Indian's capital city. The Kluge Center supports humanities scholars from around the world and brings them together uh, to stimulate and energize one another, to distill wisdom from the Library of Congress's rich resources and in, to interact with policymakers and the public. My time at the center was amazing. I think it's important to point out as well that over the course of its 15-year history, the Kluge Center has supported dozens of scholars working in the fields of Native American and Indigenous Studies. The center has been doing important work in this direction and it, as well as the librarians, archivists, and collections specialists here, have been supporting the field in really important ways. So with the time that I have, I'd like to give a brief overview of the project that I worked on as a Kluge Fellow. And I want to start with a brief anecdote, but one more caveat. My work focuses primarily on native diplomats who visited the city from outside this region. Our next speaker, Gabby Tyke, will talk more about the long, deep, and rich indigenous histories of the Potomac and Chesapeake. So here we go. On Saturday, September 29, 1837, a group of Lakota, Iowa, Sac, and Fox men and women sat in the National Theater in Washington, watching a romantic opera called The Mountain Sylph. They found themselves, as many of the other audience members likely did, mesmerized, watching the prima donna, a soprano named Annette Nelson, portray the opera's lead character. So impressed by her agility and beauty, quote, appearing and vanishing with the rapidity that reminded them of the fleetness of the deer in their native hunting grounds, wrote one newspaper, the men saluted her right in the middle of the performance. In a show of respect, Palanapapi, a Yankton man, threw an eagle-feathered cap at her feet. Pocona, a Sac chief, offered his cap as well, while Tokaka, another Yankton, gave her his white wolfskin robe. This was completely unplanned, but the actress, displaying poise and grace, thanked the men, saying she would, quote, ever regard them as friends and brethren. Then she gave each man an ostrich plume from her costume as a return gift. To a modern audience, this appears to be quite unexpected. Not just a breach of proper etiquette, but actual presence of native folks in an 1830s Washington theater enjoying an opera seems almost unbelievable. But how unexpected was it, though? 
Despite what some might think, across the 19th century and beyond, hundreds and thousands of native people traveled to and lived in the capital. In reality, scenes like this one happened regularly. While every Indian nation has its own unique and rich history, one thing that unites all of these experiences is a relationship to the federal government in Washington, DC. These episodes appear unexpected to us today because of a perceived incongruity of native people in urban spaces. In other words, the idea that Indians and cities cannot coexist and that one must necessarily be eclipsed by the other. This unexpectedness is especially rooted in Washington, D.C. due to the creation of a commemorative landscape here centered in the art and architecture of federal buildings, but dispersed around the city as well. And here are a few images of the art and artwork. Uh, this picture isn't very clear, but you can see there are two statue groups that used to stand on the east front of the Capitol building. Every president um, from the early 19th century um, until the 1950s was inaugurated between these two statue groups. This is actually Lincoln's second inauguration. There's a close-up of one of them, the Discovery. Here's the other called the Rescue. These statues were ultimately removed in the 1950s uh, in large part due to a campaign led by a native woman, she was Omaha, named Letta Meyer Smart, who wrote dozens and dozens of letters, garnered support of groups across the country. Um, they were ultimately lifted off the cheek blocks and are now in a warehouse at Fort Meade. <clears throat> I'll leave it back on there for a second, sorry. So the art and architecture of the federal buildings um, iterated spatially notions of pacification, of a conquest completed, and of vanishing Indians. My project argues that unlike the subjects of this art and architecture, though, indigenous visitors and inhabitants engaged with non-native individuals and the symbols of settler society in Washington carved out their own spaces within it and claimed or reclaimed ownership of the place. In doing so, indigenous people shaped how the capital came to understand itself ultimately as an imperial center. They were its looking glass. Washington, after all, and especially in the early 19th century, was a provincial local place first and foremost. It had to learn. It became a national city, and then an imperial capital, and later a global metropolis. I'd like to finish my remarks today with one more anecdote that illustrates the layered histories of indigenous experiences as well as representations of indigenous peoples in the capital, and this one requires a little local knowledge. I'll be talking about the Dumbarton Bridge, or as it's known commonly in the city, the Buffalo Bridge. So in 2010, a fellow historian and I were in the city. One day I went to the archives and, and he went for a run. When I returned to our room later that day, he asked if I knew anything about a bridge that had four gigantic buffaloes on it. Well, I'd only just begun the research for this project and I knew nothing about this bridge. I went back to the archives the next day and he took a walk around the city with his camera. When I returned the second evening, he showed me pictures of the four buffaloes as well as 56 Indian head busts that adorn the bridge. Native people are everywhere in the city, he said. I had to learn more. Here's an aerial shot of the bridge. Those uh, in Indian head busts that I'm talking about are at the bottom of each one of the smaller arches um, on the upper level there. And it's the same person's head over and over again. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Georgetown was formed in 1751. I'll go back to this map for a second. Decades before the District of Columbia or the city of Washington, and here you can see it on the left-hand side of the map. But in 1871, it was merged with Washington. Residential sprawl over the next few decades encouraged city leaders to provide a connecting artery between North Georgetown and DuPont Circle. There was one problem, it's pretty obvious in this map, and that is the Rock Creek and the surrounding heights that separated the two spaces. The initial plan involved filling the gorge with like boulders and junk and things like that. This was a horrible idea. But the Macmillan Commission, um, which was a Senate committee um, whose report guide, continues to guide capital development to this day, uh, selected Q Street as a location for a new bridge instead of filling in the gorge. Despite the fact, though, interestingly, that Q Street in Georgetown is 185 feet south of Q Street in DuPont Circle, so the bridge would need to be curved. And also it came to a dead end at the historic Dumbarton Mansion, which would need to be lifted up and moved about 100 feet. <laughs> so there you can see the curved bridge and the Dumbarton Mansion. Glenn Brown, who was a proponent of the Macmillan Commission and the City Beautiful uh, architecture movement, uh, designed the bridge and the structures feature several City Beautiful design elements. For example, 
You see neoclassical arches, corbel arches, piers, and pillars that are reminiscent of Roman aqueducts. More obviously, its scale and style were typical of the city beautiful aesthetic. After all, they could have simply built a functional and utilitarian bridge. The use of the buffalo and Indian head iconography, the most distinctive elements of the bridge, also connect its design to the city beautiful movement. The movement got its start in 1893 at Chicago's Columbian Exposition. And like the World's Fair itself, the bridge reflects a certain nostalgia for a vanishing frontier. In fact, in an interview, Glenn Brown noted, we quote, nat naturally determined to give the carvings of the other portions of the structure an American character. In this formulation, it makes sense that the designers chose what seems to be a generic plains motif. And I'm sorry that I don't have closer, up close pictures of the, the reliefs in buffaloes, but buffaloes and, 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 and an Indian head with prominent cheekbones and a war bonnet, these images are mobile and serve as free-floating stand-ins for a constellation of ideas that simultaneously express and excuse settler anxieties and guilt. The problem, of course, is that these images aren't free-floating and that histories aren't metaphors. There's another way to think about this bridge and its iconography, though, and the busts that sit below each pillar. These were actually modeled from the life mask of a man named Mato Wanadeka, or Kicking Bear. He was a Minneconju Lakota leader who played a significant role in bringing the ghost dance movement to the plains. In the 1890s, Kicking Bear traveled to Washington to advocate on behalf of the Lakota at the Office of Indian Affairs. This was just following Wounded Knee. Simultaneous to Kicking Bear's visit, archaeologist William Henry Holmes, who worked for the Smithsonian Bureau of Ethnology and then served as head curator of anthropology at the U.S. National Museum, conducted significant excavations around Washington. One of the sites his team investigated thoroughly was the Dumbarton Heights, an area just below, of where, just below where the bridge would ultimately be built, built. There, Holmes and his team found an important stone quarry site where Piscataway people for generations excavated materials and made stone, made stone tools. So here it is, all wrapped up in one site. A bridge built in the 19-teens using cutting-edge architectural technology and trendy design elements that are meant to memorialize and celebrate a generic and supposedly bygone American past. But the bust the designer used actually commemorates a native leader who challenged U.S. colonialism spiritually and militarily, militarily on the plains, as well as politically and diplomatically in the city itself. And they built it atop land that has been significant to indigenous inhabitants since time immemorial. Ancient, modern, vanishing, and ever-present. Thank you. Now I'd like to invite Gabby Tayek from the National Museum of the American Indian up to speak next. Hi. <laughs> I'd really like to um, greet all of you and a special greeting to uh, my relatives who are here from uh, the other areas of the bay and a little bit further out in the mountains. Um, our people are also Algonquian people, so greeting to Tara as well. And to all of you who are in this place that uh, we know as the capital, I'd like to take you to another capital. I'd like you to imagine going down the Potomac River a bit today to the first capital of these lands. There, there's an unmarked field, and there lies our holiest place. It's a place called my own. It's a sacred place. It's right on the Potomac, and it sits facing Mount Vernon. It just looks like a field, and now it's a national park. There are no signs on it. It's on the National Historic Register, but there are people who are just walking their dogs there every day, um, playing frisbee, going by, and then wondering what they're seeing when they see a sweat lodge that's there. They see a red cedar tree that's there. They see a photograph of a man named Turkey Tayak, who is my grandfather, who is there. And they see offerings, and they see reflections, and they see memories and traces of a place that are recorded back in time for at least 10,000 years, or maybe from the time that Sky Woman came and landed on a turtle's back, 
or maybe from the time that the people sprung out from the hairs of the deer and populated the land. So this is very indicative um, in this place, Moyon, which is in Akokik, Maryland, of how you are fully and completely surrounded and enveloped by a very long-term indigenous history that is almost entirely erased from our consciousness. When you go to the um, Anacostia, the Anacostans were part of our chiefdom, part of the Piscataway chiefdom. Their name was the Nekotank, and it's anglicized into, and Latinized to sound like Anacostia. But all we know is there's the river. There's the Potomac or Padawomic, which is also a group of people. There are places like Madawoman and Zakaya, and all sorts of words that we see on the land. And this landscape in itself is formed by the Chesapeake Bay. And the Chesapeake meaning Great Shellfish Bay, which is the mother of waters, which has lungs that are formed by vast amounts historically of oysters and oyster shells, which filter the water pristinely that have been entirely taken out. So in this interconnected, beautiful system that was first um, mapped for Europeans by John Smith in 1608, um, and he didn't look like Disney movie guy, okay? <laughs> And he didn't marry Pocahontas. <laughs> um, and Pocahontas was a lot cooler than you would ever, ever imagine her to be, actually. And I've had a love-hate relationship with Pocahontas for my entire life. Um, and I've come to respect her greatly. So our people were, were organized uh, here with Point of Rocks, the quarries that you speak about being kind of on the the edges of it, going into what we call the fall line, all the way down uh, to Point Lookout, which is where the Yakamako people were. And then the heart of it is at this place that I'm describing to you, just about 15 miles south of the DC line in Piscataway National Park today. The way it was organized was we had a central chief uh, who was actually called the Tayak, and my surname is part of uh, an acknowledgement and an honor to my grandfather who really revitalized that role and decided to uh, take that surname legally uh, because of the activism that was happening here in the 19, late 1960s and 1970s, but he started using it in the 1930s. And so the Tayak was somebody who was able to bring in um, people from over a dozen towns each with a leader called a Warawans, who could also be a woman who was known as a Warawanskwa, advised by Wizos or peace chiefs, Kakoroses, who were uh, considered to be, by an English system, war chiefs, but in fact, these were statesmen. And it, that word is linked to the word that uh, we now think about as caucus, so in terms of a, of a negotiation. and. That is where um, we have this the system operating in what is often known or thought about as prehistory, but it's history. And so about 13 generations before the Ark and the Dove came in 1634, there was a man on the eastern shore of Maryland named Utapoingasinam, and he broke off from the Nanakoke and established this governmental polity um, here on the western shore and started to basically look at, it was kind of not really a federal system, but not too far out from that in terms of a centralized area, power at Moyon, a town that then would receive, um, receive tribute and interaction and communication from around the region. And they would bring people together um, through ceremony. So there's a there's a really, there's a very long history. And the question is, why do we not know anything about this capital? Why doesn't anybody here speak Piscataway anymore? And that's wrapped up, you know, if you really want to know what the language is, 
and what the history is. And you want to know, well, was, what, what happened to people? You just have to kind of see of all of these things that have been built up over the landscape. So the history here, I'm just going to wrap up because seven minutes to take you through 400 years is <laughs> Especially because, you know, we were chatting a little bit and I was thinking there's been a lot of silencing and um, a lot of times we, we do like to take up our time <laughs> when, we, when we need to speak. But the, the issue is, is that that question of what happened and why you don't know and why you have to dig so hard in the primary records and then also look through the oral histories are extremely essential. And so that's what I would want to talk about because the, you know, we'll, we'll talk more, but really this idea of the merging of what has remained in terms of oral account, matching it up with what's available in the documentary account, um, because I started my work by um, listening around the kitchen table, by being involved with the revitalization um, of the people and then deciding I wanted to take an academic track to really figure it out and bring those voices forward. So that work is, it's, it's long, hard work and it's, it's a puzzle um, over time. And there are very unique things about this, about this region um, that follow the patterns that we see for Native people across the continent, but also get wrapped up in something particularly vicious and, and pervasive on the Atlantic seaboard and that has to do with race policy. So there's a, there's a lot of intertwining here and we'll have a chance to talk more, but in the meantime, just to kind of reorient your, your headspace to how, how long this history has been going. It's not been since 1800 and it's not been since 1750 and it's not been since 1607. It's been for a very long time. So with that, I'd like to introduce Tara, who will bring us right up into the present. <laughs> Thank you. Bijou, Tara Indigenous Jaganashimong, Minawa Jabwekwe Indigenous Nishinabemong, Makwan Dudame, Gojujing and Dunjaba. My name is Tara Hauska. My Indian name is the woman who finishes the song, and I'm Bear Clan and from Kuchiching First Nation. Um, so, like Gabby said, I'm, I think I'm here to represent the present. Um, my perspective is one of many Native Americans who graduate and move to Washington, D.C. to go represent our nations. Um, all of Indian law is federal. It's federal law and tribal law, and so this is kind of where everything is decided. This is where all the policies that affect our people are decided. Um, these are the congressional members that control our fates, really, in a lot of ways. Um, so it's a, it's a really different experience being in D.C., for sure. Um, Native Americans are very community-based, and I think one of the first things you do is find your fellow Native Americans and kind of like, hey, guys, I'm here, you know, and it's a, it's a kind of a, a changing group because there's a lot of transplants coming in and out. But um, that is pretty much the first thing you do when you get here. And uh, I think... It's important to understand kind of how it feels to be a Native American in DC um, and to work and live in these spaces beyond just like not having a, you know, your own community and being with your own people and your land and all of that. Um, I think one of the very hard things, at least for me, um, and that's also why I became connected to Joe, was moving here and seeing the mascot. Um, that was a really kind of shocking experience for me. Uh, in Minnesota, where I'm from, we actually banned Native mascots back in 1992. So it just wasn't an issue and something I never really thought about. Um, and, you know, I was standing in Subway, I think a couple weeks into work. Uh, I work at a Native American law firm. We practice basically Native American law. And uh, I was standing in Subway, and the guy in front of me is wearing a hat, and the guy behind me is wearing a jersey, and the employees are all wearing pins because there was some promotion going on and that name was everywhere and that head was everywhere. And I was shocked, kind of floored at that moment, thinking about what it would be like to actually be a Native American child here and to grow up here and to see that and just you know, know that that's what people really think of you. Um, 
today I'm wearing moccasins. It's Rock Your Mox Day. <laughs> and I've already on the way in here got a lot of really strange looks, right? Um, because I think it's kind of the issue of the mascot and just kind of the overall sense of Native Americans is that we are a vanished people. And so when they see something like this, it kind of shocks them like, oh my goodness, are there Native Americans that are, that are here and they exist and you know, they're, they're in Washington DC working and living in these places? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. We're just not walking around in headdresses and you know, painting our faces, which is what they expect. Um, so that's kind of, uh, that really spurned me towards uh, doing a lot of social justice work and becoming heavily involved with the mascot movement and you know, kind of doing what I can from DC to help the representation of Native Americans across the board and how we're portrayed in, in uh, the media, but also here in DC. I mean, it, it is something that in the work I do, I go and lobby on Capitol Hill and you know, we're pushing for, we need, we need money for a hospital. We need you know, the right to prosecute individuals on the reservation. These are things that we don't have. They're fundamental things that we don't have. And it's hard when you walk in knowing that you know, the congressional member, depending on how many tribes they have in their region, or maybe they don't have any, um, is gonna have this kind of idea already in their heads before they see you, that you are this old static character and that, you know, well, we don't really wanna give the Indians you know, the right to do these things because they're you know, not civilized, right? I mean, those are, those are real impacts that really actually do um, affect us. And it, it also, you know, I think the more important thing is really about children, but um, just today, I, or this last week actually, um, I had the honor of speaking with Bernie Sanders as he was introducing a bill. Um, I do a lot of environmental justice work as well. And it was funny because that morning, he doesn't have any uh, tribes, in, any federally recognized tribes in, in Vermont. And that very morning, he had actually met with a delegation of Apache people from Oak Flat. Um, Oak Flat is a sacred place that was actually given by the federal government to a foreign mining operation, and it's about to be destroyed. That is our, that is our Congress. And so he met with them, and you know, to a guy that has no idea about tribes, I think it was kind of really shocking to him and really inspired and moved him. And then when he's walking out towards me, I could just see his eyebrows go up, like, <laughs> oh my goodness, another Indian? Like, and I'm like, we're everywhere, you know? <laughs> we're everywhere. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, as researchers and, you know, we come, I've been to the Library of Congress several times. I mean, a lot of the work we do in federal Indian law is hundreds of years old, right? I mean, federal Indian law is a moving body of law, but it's also, I mean, you're going to be citing a case from 1800 every now and again in a brief. It's a really strange area of law, but you also get to learn a lot of history along the way. Um, so I think it's, it, it's very important to be cognizant that we are modern people, that we are here, um, that representation really does matter, that we should be doing everything we possibly can to educate people about you know, the tribal nations that are here and the ones that are, have been coming here for, I mean, since, since the beginning, right? The very, very beginning, there have been delegations of tribal leaders and you know, the National Congress of American Indians is here in, in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm one of many, many people that comes out here as an attorney, as you know, a staffer, as every, every kind of a possible job you can imagine, that's what we're doing out here in Washington, D.C. Um, so I think it's very important for, you, for all of you to at least try to make people aware of that. Um, everyone that I've worked with here in the Library of Congress has been fantastic as far as doing research and understanding, and I've gotten to hold treaties and you know, all, these, all these really great things, right? Um, and I, you know, I, I just encourage you to do that, and thank you. And it's a little, it's a little awkward not being on a panel and talking to y'all like this. <laughs> Hope, hopefully, the talk is much better. Thanks. Oh. oh, and I'm introducing. This is Karen. <laughs> Um, I want to welcome you to our homeland. I'm a Monacan person. My name is Karen Wood. I direct Virginia Indian programs at the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. So in my professional life, I'm a public historian and an educator, all about filling the gaps between the past and the present and so much of that story that's been left out um, in understanding what's happened to our people. Um, in my not-so-professional life, I'm a poet, 
So I started out life as a writer, and I've written two books of poetry. The second one comes out this spring, called Weaving the Boundary. And it focuses, too, on American Indian history, because there are so many gaps in the larger story beyond Virginia um, <clears throat> that many people don't know about. What we do know is that people have been in what we call Virginia for 18,000 years. When I was in school, it was presented as an absolute scientific fact that Native people came across the Bering Straits land bridge carrying spears and hunting mastodons and wearing fur coats, and that happened 10 to 12,000 years ago. So archaeologists have had to now call into question everything that they've told us about how we got here. And I found it very interesting and comforting <clears throat> to realize that there are Native stories in our area that reference giant bears, giant beavers, and giant bison. And everybody said, oh, isn't that cute, those Native legends? And then archaeologists found evidence of those creatures in Virginia. So this is the kind of information that I get to encounter every day. And I didn't start out as a researcher. I started out as a tribal historian in order to <clears throat> collect the history that we didn't have about our story. I had to become a researcher. And so my friend and I, my tribal friend, uh, Diane Shields and I, for about 10 years, Dealt, uh, dug into all of the records we could find and began to reconstruct that story so that we could develop a petition that would go to the Bureau of Indian Affairs documenting our case for federal recognition. What we now have is a historical chronology that traces the movements of our people and the places in which they appear in historical records. And what I've learned in that process is that people who write history have agendas. It's not absolute objective facts in the way that we were told in school. <clears throat> and I've also learned that whenever you tell a story, you decide what to leave in and what to leave out. And in our case, an awful lot has been left out, including most of the voices, I like to say, you know, maybe 75% of the people who participated in history, all of the women, all the people of color, all the poor white people, their voices were not present in the stories that I learned in school. When we took our elders to Virginia Tech for the first time to show them what kind of a higher education was possible for their grandkids, some of them cried because it was not even conceivable that they could attend a university like that. Most of them went to a one-room school, first through seventh grade, up until 1963 in Virginia. And if they wanted to go to high school, they had to go to a federal Indian boarding school in Muskogee, Oklahoma, which meant that they left in September and didn't see their families again until June because they couldn't afford to come home for Christmas. They didn't know their brothers and sisters. They didn't really have the relationships with their parents that most of us have enjoyed without even thinking about it. So <clears throat> we have learned these things about ourselves by studying that history and studying the accounts of people like John Smith. I love John Smith's map. It's remarkably accurate, considering how little of that area he actually visited. So what that tells me is that there were Native people, informants, anthropologists call them, who were able to, <laughs> yeah, to translate um, for him the geography of what's now Virginia on a flat piece of paper, right? This is the way the rivers go and so on. And what I've also realized in looking at these records is that Native history is inscribed on the place, by the place names um, that we have given certain areas. And there are many Native place names in the coastal plain where the Piscataway people and other Algonquian speakers lived at or live because they did a lot of interacting with the colonial um, people who did the documenting not so much with my people. We seem to want to avoid contact, probably for good reason. Maybe we would heard some stories <laughs> about what happened uh, when those explorers showed up. We called them people whose faces grew hair upside down. Um, <clears throat> but there's not a lot of documentation about the Monacans and, and what happened to them in, re in comparison to the Powhatan people. And there aren't as many place names. So if you look at the creeks and rivers up in our area, you don't see our language 
represents it in the way that you do, you know, Piscataway and Patuxent and Potomac and, I mean, almost every river, uh, Pamunkey, you know, the, the rivers took the names from the people who lived there. And we don't necessarily know what the native people called them. But I live in my house 15 minutes from the headquarters of the Monacan Nation during colonial times where the Ravana and James Rivers come together. So I'm home, you know, and I like it there. Um, in any event, putting all of this story together has just convinced me that there are so many ways to tell about the past, and history is only one of those ways. Native people had broad and beautiful ways of understanding the world and their place in it, and enough of those traces remain to us that we can continue to put ourselves in that web and understand our responsibilities as human beings, not as caretakers in a kind of Adam and Eve sense, but as relatives. And, and I, I think that that is the most important thing that we fail to teach kids, is how to be a good relative, how to be part of a community. Um, and Native people still know how to do that. You know, it's not about distinguishing yourself as an individual. And I said, when I came into the academy, I did it for a very specific reason. Someone had said, Karen Wood is a self-styled historian, mm -hmm. because I didn't have a PhD. And that irritated me, so I got one. <laughs> it took me quite a while. It was also annoying when people said, I really admire you going back to school at your age. You know, um, but I did it not because I wanted to change my job, but because I wanted the validation to be able to say, I'm as much an expert on my people's story as somebody else's. You know? And when I did it, <clears throat> I didn't come in as an individual who is supposed to come up with some exciting concept or invent a new term or what we like to do to academics. You have to do something new, and then all your colleagues look at your work and go, rah, 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 and tear you <laughs> up. You know, What I came in with was a whole community of people on my shoulders who were more than happy to tell me if I was doing it wrong. You know, I have a responsibility to tell the story in a way that honors those ancestors and that collectively um, and expands the story that we know. When the elders came to us, they said, you young people have to get an education and change what's in those books because we aren't the people they describe. We are not savages, you know, and they didn't see themselves in those stories. So it's so important to me to continue the work that I do and to bring more people into the mix to help us. We have a lot of work to do. And I'm honored to be part of it, to be able to do that. So thank you. All right, well, um, again, yes, my name is Ben Norman. Um, coming from Pamunkey Tribe, which is located in, in Virginia. Um, if you're familiar, there's uh, the York River that comes into Virginia and it splits into two rivers, which is the Pamunkey and Mattapani rivers. So um, there on the left side, uh, the left, that's uh, you know where where we're located, right, kind of right around that uh, peninsula. So um, so yeah, again, thanks for for having me here. Thanks for all of our co-presenters, and it's really great um, hearing from them and um, also hearing uh, language from them and um, there's a lot of there's some work being done uh, recently with, with our language and uh, one person is uh, participating in that is um, uh, Ian Custola and uh, through some of his research um, he's actually found um, what he thinks is the meaning of uh, Pamunkey which is crazy that we're actually don't know that um, at this point. Um, but what he's found is that um, it actually means place where people sweat is what it means. And, um, uh, you know, it's a place where people come to pray, you know, is, is what that means. Um, sounds kind of funny. But, um, but yeah, that's the, the actual, uh, according to his research that he's done, uh, uh, what it means, place where people sweat. So it was a place that was uh, very well protected 
Uh, so I think that leaders and individuals that needed to come for, uh, you know, maybe downtime uh, and also, you know, a way to come and, uh, and pray. Um, so when I first heard of uh, the topic of this discussion, uh, American Indians in, in federal, center, federal city and uh, regional history, um, I thought I kind of fit into into both of these ideas um, from Pamunkey, which is within this region, and I've moved here um, to come work here in here in Washington D.C. at the National Museum of American Indian. Um, so <coughs> uh, it also made me start to think about people uh, from my own families that have come here uh, to D.C. for different reasons, um, like my father, uh, Frank Bradby, I remember him telling me about coming here um, in 1978 uh, for the longest walk to help to, um, uh, you know, participate in the longest walk and bring attention to um, treaty rights and, you know, things that were going on uh, in Native communities. Um, it also made me think of my, um, my wife's grandmother. Um, her name is uh, Vilma Peters. She's uh, from the Pawnee and Oto Nations in Oklahoma. <clears throat> and um, so uh, I remember hearing, I was hearing stories of her um, coming here. She was a member of the American Indian Movement. And uh, I remember you know, hearing stories of her coming here to DC for different occasions. Um, one of these stories is in um, 1972. Uh, Vilma and her youngest son travel here to D.C. Um, again, to bring attention to standards of living, back at home, treaty rights. Um, during that trip, things escalated and uh, eventually, as you may know, took over the, uh, the BIA building, Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, building. Um, and they stayed there for seven days. Um, and uh, at uh, her, her funeral, um, a lot of her things, uh, possessions were there for people to come, um, photos, um, important things to her, you know, uh, artwork that her grandchildren had made. Um, there's even a really awesome American Indian jacket that um, was hers, um, that was there. Political pins, um, things that she kept. And one that really stuck out to me, it, it just said, another Indian for Dukakis. <laughs> um, and also, there was a, um, a book that was there, like it looked like a journal that was there on the table, and I, first I didn't really want to read it. I thought it was a, kind of an invasion of uh, her privacy, was, you know, her journal, but I saw some other uh, family members reading it, so I figured I couldn't resist. I'll take a look at it, and, uh, which I'm really glad I did. Um, <clears throat> um, and it, it was a journal, and it was actually a journal of her time spent here in, here in Washington, D.C. Um, during that trip. And it was a very detailed uh, journal. Um, it was so detailed. Um, it included everything from where she stayed, um, all of the taxis um, that she rode in, uh, where they were picked up, where they were dropped off, and even the price, even the price of the, uh, the taxi. It was very, very detailed. Um, so um, the end, uh, kind of near the end of the journal, um, I thought it was really interesting. I guess the government and politicians were really wanting them to leave because they actually bought her a plane ticket, her and her son, to fly back to Oklahoma. <laughs> um, and uh, in the last, uh, <coughs> the last journal entry, she said um, her and her son, which his name's um, Thomas Whiteshirt, um, he was seven years old at the time, you know, during this trip. They, uh, 
you know, they were actually in the air while she was writing the final journey, uh, the final journal entry. And she was um, thinking about um, the work, you know, the work they had done here, the attention they had brought to the issues here. Um, and she was hopeful in this last entry, you know, hopeful for the future generations of Native children, you know, will be uh, in a better situation uh, because of their work. So, um, so things like this kind of every once in a while will kind of re rejuvenate me and um, the work that we're doing at the museum, trying to you know educate the the public. Um, so, uh, as you probably uh, guess, we get a lot of crazy questions there at work, and 99% um, of um, the time, you know, we're, um, you know, I feel really good uh, about what we're doing, but sometimes, you know, you'll get uh, people just trying to argue or things like that, um, and sometimes they're kind of funny questions, like once we had a question of, uh, why, why did the Indians follow the buffalo? Was it for their milk? <laughs> that was a real question from an adult also, not, not a child. So, uh, um, let's see, another one. Some of them are kind of heartbreaking um, for you. Like one I actually got from a chaperone on a school tour was um, how many breeds of Native Americans are there? Um, Another one, and this was one that I just overheard. Two ladies were going to go to the restroom, and they were, um, the restroom was closed. So one of them said, I wonder why it's closed. And the other one said, well, you know, Indians really don't know about plumbing. <laughs> so um, so they, we have uh, questions like that. And they really, they really stick with you. Um, especially early on when I first was working in the museum, it really st stuck with me, came home with me, and I thought about it. Um, now that I've been, been there for a long time, it's, they don't affect me as much. I just try to take these moments as a learning opportunity to work with the public and educate them. Um, <clears throat> so, and also, as I mentioned, I also fit into this because I'm from Pamunkey. Um, currently, you may know um, some of our situation at the moment, um, you may uh, think that we're federally recognized, 567 uh, recognized tribe, but um, it's kind of in limbo at the moment. Um, I think a lot of people heard the news originally that we were federally recognized and maybe not as many people know that we were challenged um, again, um, which was kind of expected um, because these don't even want to mention their names um, who challenged us, but um, they, uh, you know, are in this for a different reason. Um, some of the things that they're challenging and so on are basically if we are uh, Native Americans and if we're, if our, um, if we're a nation, you know, um, that still continues today. And they're both, you know, really uh, ridiculous. Um, one of the really amazing things about our community, because we have been, we're some of the first people, you know, to get um, basically colonized. Um, so we have lost a lot of our uh, ways during this, uh, you know, these hundreds of years. But our government has always continued, uh, still to this day. You know, it never, never stopped. We have minutes uh, recorded of our meetings going back. Um, over a hundred years, um, so these uh, these questions, uh, you know, of our uh, Indianness or our um, government continuing are ridiculous. So hopefully, through this board, this independent board that's going to review this, uh, hopefully, the process will go quickly and we'll be able to um, um, continue. And there's really important work that needs to be done in our community and uh, for our future future generations. I have a son that's two and one, one that's on the way right now in, um, in January, so I'm really excited for them um, you know, and the, and the future possibilities for them and for the children from our community. 
So, um, so thanks everyone. Um, and I'm sure we'll continue our panel discussion now. So, thank you. I'm Eric Eldridge. I'm a program specialist with the Office of Opportunity, Inclusiveness, and Compliance. And we were glad to be a co-sponsor of uh, the event today. At this point, I'd like to ask our curators uh, to come forward and to give a, uh, a quick overview of the materials that they brought from the collections. And then uh, this is also a good break if you're a library employee and you need to, to step out. And then uh, we will continue the conversation. So while uh, Mike and others are coming forward, I'll let you know that if uh, you look in the back and you, and you get this uh, bookmark, with this bookmark you have five million pictures in your hands. And this is uh, an amazing trove. This comes from the Prints and Photographs online catalog. And this material is readily available to you 24-7. Uh, and uh, we wanted to let you know the Prints and Photographs has materials up there. If American Folklife, the Geography and Map, if you come up and tell us just a brief synopsis of what's in your collection. Then we'll get back to our open discussion with our panelists. Hello and greetings. Uh, I'm Judith Gray from the American Folklife Center. Our archive of folk culture holds perhaps the largest collection of one-of-a-kind field recordings of tribal materials, probably 2,000 hours representing materials from about 160, 170 communities uh, just within the U.S. and some slightly bordering Canadian areas. We also have materials from uh, indigenous communities in other parts of the world. Uh, what I've brought, however, is not going to be much that's from this immediate area. By the time the audiovisual recording devices were around, uh, most of the ethnologists and linguists were headed to parts of the country where there were larger concentrations of people living more traditional ways, perhaps, at the time. So most of the recordings that we have tend to be Plains, uh, Southwest, California, um, also quite a few New York Iroquoian uh, communities uh, from the upper Midwest. Yes, we have Anishinaabe from Minnesota, Wisconsin, um, Menominee people, Iowa uh, people and such, but very, very, very little from this particular area. So I can't provide you with uh, recordings like that. I do have, however, for example, the very earliest field recording that we're aware of, um, made 125 years ago, March uh, 15th, 1890, two Passamaquoddy men sang songs and uh, spoke narratives to a, uh, to a recordist. So please stop by and be glad to talk with you further about our resources. Good afternoon, I'm Mike Busher. I'm the Head of Reference Services with the Geography and Map Division. We're the largest map library in the world. We have about five and a half million maps. Uh, our collections related to uh, Native Americans are actually a kind of a hidden collection. Uh, we've only cataloged less than half of our collection. So if you sit at home in front of your computer uh, looking for, for historical maps we, we might have, you're going to find a very small percentage. The way to, to actually get into this collection is to, to make contact with us or actually, best of all, stop by for a visit. But I would encourage you to take a look at our, uh, our website. We have a lot of our historical materials up, at least some of our key items. I brought the 1606 uh, John Smith. Uh, facsimile of the 1606 John Smith map if you want to take a look at it. But the way to really get into our collections is to actually come visit us and, and take a look. And, and there's a, a lot of great pro uh, projects and uh, papers hidden in our collections. Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 5, and you can <laughs> connect with us through our website. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Barbara Baer. I'm a historian in the Manuscript Division here at the Library of Congress. And I've brought uh, 
selection of items that are from different parts of uh, North America, from Canada and the United States, representative of different tribal peoples. In the manuscript division as a whole, we have over 60 million items and more than 11,000 collections. And you can find many of our materials online and also in the virtual exhibition sites that are available through the Library of Congress website. <laughs> Today, um, after the discussion is finished, you can come back to, to see the um, materials that I brought. And they begin with a Mi'kmaq Indian prayer book, which is one of the um, earliest uh, known scripts of Native Americans. And as Karen pointed out, um, all documents are subjective. In other words, no history is objective. They're created with an agenda. Um, created by certain authors and with certain kinds of collaborations. And everything that we have is subject to interpretation and reinterpretation over time. The next item that I brought was uh, a illustration from an 18th century ship captain's diary of First Nation people in the Nutick Sound off of British Columbia, which is also one of the earlier illustrations that we have. And I, I wanted to say that you know one of the problems, of course, with written sources is that they're very new. They're just the tip of the iceberg of actual history, as has also been pointed out by today's speakers, um, that the, there's a very, very long oral tradition that precedes this. Um, the next item that I brought is about the Red Stick Rebellion. And it's a list of names of Creek Indians who served with the Tennessee militia under Andrew Jackson. And it makes the point that it was a, a Creek Civil War, that there were Native peoples on both sides. The Cherokee and the Choctaw um, joined in Confederation with the Lower Creeks against the Red Sticks, who were very um, determined to preserve traditional ways and to work against white, the incursion of white culture and of Western expansion. Um, related to that is a letter that Principal Chief Cher of the Cherokee Nation, John Ross, wrote to Andrew Jackson, along with uh, other delegates from the Cherokee Nation, protesting the violence and the confiscation of property in Georgia, and his long role in the 1830s in um, uh, reacting against Indian removal. I've brought a few items from the Henry Rose Schoolcraft collection, which is one of our major collections of Native American material in the manuscript division. Um, Henry Rose Schoolcraft, as you no doubt know, was an Indian agent in Michigan and uh, became a superintendent of Indian affairs in the Detroit area once the Michigan became a state. He married the Native American poet, who is now very famed and deservedly so, as the first uh, Native American poet who published in the um, mainstream literary tradition in the United States, Jane Johnston Schoolcraft. And I've brought a manuscript of one of her poems, and also an example of one of the many Native American, in this case Chippewa, uh, legends and tales that were collected. Um, Henry Rowe Schoolcraft got credit for the vocabularies and legends that were collected. But Jane was instrumental in all of that work, and he could not have done it without her family. Um, it was her family that provided the contacts and introduced the people that um, told the stories that were transcribed. And we have several volumes of those stories if you're interested in that, um, the literary tradition of the Chippewa. Uh, I also brought a article that Walt Whitman wrote when it, he wrote it in the 1880s, but it's a reminiscence of his time serving as a civil servant at the Department of Interior, where he worked in the Department of Indian Affairs. This is very briefly at the end of the Civil War for a few months. And he wrote a very paternalistic article about it later in life. And um, we do have the largest collection of Walt Whitman papers um, in the world here at the Library of Congress. And there are also drafts in his collection of poems that mention Native Americans. And he did uh, prescribe to a very romanticized, um, vanishing race, noble savage sort of vision 
of, of Native American life in the association with the wilderness. And um, <clears throat> I would just note, because it came up in the collection, uh, I mean in the earlier talks, that we also have materials on the Beautiful City movement because we have the Frederick Law Olmsted papers. So there's a great deal there about um, Native American and um, other ethnic ideology and symbolism that was um, replete in those, um, that, that school of architecture and landscape design. Um, the, the last items that I brought are from the C. Hart Merriam um, collection. C. Hart Merriam was an ethnologist, archaeologist, zoologist, and he did extensive work in California and Nevada. And I've brought a, one of his um, hand-colored and labeled maps that shows the linguistic groups in California and Nevada, and also one of his many fieldwork vocabulary um, forms, which in this case is for the Tuolumne language. Um, and one of the things that was interesting about that is that there's a category of names for supernatural beings, and one of the things that he added in by hand is the name for a mermaid, um, which was a reference to um, tales of nymphs who lived in the deep holes of the Tuolumne River. So um, on that note, I'll pass it up. So we do have a bit of time for some discussion, but I want to put this map up, which is actually in the, the Geography and Maps collection. Gabby, this is the map that I mentioned to you previously. I meant to put this up before I, um, before I finished up, but this is a, a map from the late 19th century put together by um, a symposium of um, archaeologists working in the district. It's a map of the District of Columbia showing, uh, quote, ancient village sites, and you can see the triangles and uh, rectangles there. Um, indicating sites within the district um, that had been uh, studied at that point. Um, so I have actually two sets of questions that I would like to offer to our panelists, and um, I'd like to invite um, and any of you to come up after um, uh, after I ask the first set. Uh, and that is, um, you know, we've got a number of students in, in the room here. Um, students of mine from George Mason University came today, but we're also being um, live cast, and this uh, video of this panel will be on the library's website, so potentially future students who are interested in the, the histories of this region, working with communities here. Um, all of you have devoted your lives to, to this research, to this work, to these communities. And so I'd like to ask for those who would like to do the same, would, would be interested in doing the same, what are some, what, what, what is some advice that you would offer to them? Um, what are some things that you would, you would suggest? What are some promises? But also, what are some potential pitfalls? What are things that, that researchers wanting to work in this, re this region and with communities here um, might want to avoid? So um, I would like to open it up to, to whomever to, to actually come up for this. All together. Sure. We'll just make a little panel here. <laughs> um, so pitfalls and opportunities. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so um, I would have to say that there are some really obvious issues um, for research uh, regarding Native people across the board and in particular in this region is that the material is very early. Um, and the ability to understand what the native point of view on this is also, uh, it's difficult. So you have to go through many different filters um, and sometimes go to places that you wouldn't think to go. So for example, with uh, Piscataway history, um, we have the Jesuit relations we have the Maryland archives, all of this being told in, in um, English colonial voice. Um, sometimes with reporting about how, um, you know, what, what basically transcription, supposed transcriptions of what Native people had to say. The way that I started to fill some of this in, and this is just a lifelong thing, and some of it is just pay attention. Um, and start to have people who maybe are doing other work pay attention and sometimes they'll start to fill in the gaps. So 
One of the sources that I did go to, and it was really hard to get my dissertation committee to accept this all those years ago. It took me a really long time for them to finally get this, was that I went to the Haudenosaunee, to the Iroquois Confederacy, because some of our people had um, ended up, um, because of the, all the pressures here, they ended up in Pennsylvania coming under Haudenosaunee, Iroquois jurisdiction, and some of our people got adopted in um, to the Cayuga Wolf Clan and end up at Six Nations. So this was like, you're talking from about 1701 up through, um, it was about the year uh, 1987 that I encountered Chief Jake Thomas, Cayuga Wolf Clan chief. And I started to talk to him. And I said, do you know anything, um, you know, about us? Because they know us as Kanoi. And he said, yeah, I, I do. And as a matter of fact, I have a binder here of written um, accord of what happened um, in the Cayuga language. And it was like telling it from the other side of what had happened. So there's fragments and weird pieces and having to look um, around and to do the unexpected and to listen to stories, hear people's names. Um, we have an oral account about the Battle of Fallen Timbers of our people in 1794. Um, we have an oral account of it that has to do with um, that the people chose a place where lightning had hit trees and that's why it called Fallen Timbers. Fast forward a year to the 1990s, Moravian Town, Ontario, there's a guy whose native name is Fallen Timbers. I was like, I need to talk to you. And so, you know, it's, so there's a lot, it's just these little, these fragments and pulling it together, listening to what's uh, involved in, in terms of like other people's encoded in songs, dances, oral account, um, sometimes hearing it when we're not doing research, but maybe we're all at a protest together and we start chatting, you know, or something. So there's, yeah, there's a lot there. Research. Research. Um, so one pitfall I think I would also add is I would very, very, very strongly encourage, I, I can't stress it enough, when you're looking at these issues of indigenous people, whatever it happens to be, talk to indigenous people. Mm -hmm. um, I've been involved in too many situations where the topic is something involving Native Americans. It's a very specific issue to Native American communities. And at the last second, a huge group of people, I mean, you should, 20, 30 people that are trying to put together an event, maybe we should include a Native American. Yeah. And they, get, they call you the day of or something like that or the day before and you're like, oh, yeah, and you're one. You know, you're like the one person. And, it, you know, it, there's this understanding, yes, Native Americans are 2% of the population. There's not a, a whole lot of us. And, you know, the capacity is not always there, but we are there. And you will find someone that's willing to come and, and speak with you about these things. And, you know, there's, there's going to be someone at that nation or someone that, you know, can connect you to the right person to actually get an indigenous perspective. Um, only doing it straight from research and you know these often biased histories is, is not the best way to go about things. I guess one thing that I would like to add, having been on the Monacan Tribal Council for about 12 years, is that very often academics and people who want to get PhDs come to us with their projects and say, can you help me? And, and they want us to help them put their dissertation together and then they're going to leave and we're never going to see them again. Mm -hmm. And our attitude over time has become, we don't really have time to help you in the sense that what are you going to do in return? Are you going to build a relationship with us that will be mutually beneficial or are we just helping you get your PhD and that's it? You know, and, and so often people don't seem to understand that there should be an exchange, you know, or some uh, group of well-meaning people in our neighborhood will come and say, here's this project, don't you think it's great? We want you to approve of it. And they didn't ask us to be involved in the planning of the project or consider whether it would be useful um, to us in terms of time as well. So I think one of the things that I like to encourage people to do is before you begin the project, develop a relationship that is respectful and that might benefit both parties so that there's an actual dialogue and that way everybody feels included. Um, well, for me, um, 
thinking of what I do and how to maybe encourage young people out there that may be watching this, that maybe are interested in uh, museums, um, there's a lot of uh, great programs. And I remember when I was a kid, young, you know, I didn't think I'd be working in a museum one day. That thought never really entered into my mind. Um, but I ended up working for a short time at our Pamunkey Indian Museum and um, got me interested and got me experience and was able to come here. But if you're very interested, definitely look at uh, museum studies programs, American Indian study programs, um, yeah, and um, fill out, learn how to uh, fill out job applications. <laughs> you can say jobs. That's really important. <laughs> Well, so the um, the other question that I had, and it, it's kind of more, um, I guess, a little bit more pointed, maybe, um, and and that is when I think about the history of Washington D.C. and the history of the the um, delegations and, and diplomats coming into the city um, over the past two hundred plus years, um, m all of them are coming to negotiate treaties with the federal government, but also making very bold, very visible often, um, statements about sovereignty. When they do this, they're not only making a statement about the sovereignty of their own nations in at the capital of the United States, but they're also doing it on the homelands of the Piscataway people and within a, within a broader region. That makes Washington, D.C. a different kind of city, and, and when we think about the, the urban indigenous history of Seattle or, or Chicago or Detroit or Minneapolis, the, the, that's a different history than, than, than Washington. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder what, and, and I think you all have different perspectives to offer on this issue, and I wonder what, what, you, what you might think about that and what you might say about that. Okay. Anyway, well, yeah, so here's, here's to fast forward a bit where, you know, I was talking earlier about some of this really deep ancestral history, but Given our location, um, that has been abso absolutely integral, part and parcel of what did happen next, what has happened next, and what continues to be engaged with our community. Um, we have um, really been, in many ways, um, hosting these delegations coming in. Um, the earliest ones that I know my grandfather talked about was relationships with people coming into D.C. from the 1920s. Um, and this is where he started uh, doing sometimes recordings with people. There was a, a few things that I, uh, that actually there's uh, cards for here, but the sound recording was lost. But that's where um, there's just been this incredible energy and back and forth. I think that's probably been a very key factor to the way that, that our community really resuscitated was because of our location, because of Native people coming in, our folks encountering them, having them come to stay um, with us. I mean, this is before people had expense accounts and um, abilities to host. Uh, from the 1920s through the 1940s with the founding of NCAI, through the 1950s, and particularly in the late 1960s, um, a man named Jean Shenandoah in the around 1970, 71, came in as an advanced um, team to, for the American Indian movement, ran into my uncle at a diner, and they looked at each other and they were like, hey. <laughs> and um, that meant that uh, our folks went whole in on um, the American Indian movement, it was, it meant that uh, the couple people who hung on to the culture suddenly got very energized, started to interact. Um, they were at the BIA takeover, they were on the longest walk. Then they started going out west, started going to Sundance as our people started intermarrying with people out mm -hmm. west. We were involved with the takeover of Ganyange, um, up at Mohawk territory, going with people to lobby at Congress and then opening it up hemispherically. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have a lot of um, contacts with Amazonians, Central Americans. We've married some of those folks, <laughs> had kids with some of those people. There's lots of like Turtle Island Piscataways around. And so I think it's, it's a, yeah, that's been a, it's been a huge um, factor back and forth. 
even though there's not a there's not a lot of us um, that it's it really um, started to generate when we reincorporated formally in 1974 we chose the date of the Battle of Little Bighorn to do it um, so you know it's yeah it's been a very very active relationship yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, so I think her perspective is probably one of the more important ones <laughs> since we were from Scataway. Um, it's, it definitely is, you know, when you come here, you are, it's often um, included in any type of dialogue that you have, or at least, you know, what I've seen of tribal leaders talking to the federal government to remind them that we're on Indian lands. That's always part of the conversation is to remind them we're on Indian lands because that kind of really stands for a lot. We're not here um, saying that, you know, these old treaty rights or whatever, which I would like to add, the Constitution is old and we still follow that. So I never understand that argument. It's ridiculous. Um, but to remind them that, you know, the reason that these that the United States is here is because of the Indian, the Indian people that were and still are here. Um, so I, I, I do think, you know, it, it's great when people come in from out of town. And myself, I mean, the first thing you do is find the community. Um, it's a little bit harder here. I'm, I actually lived and worked in Minneapolis for a long time, and that's where the American Indian Movement was founded. And so we have a whole section and a whole area of town that's, you know, you go there and you're going to see lots of people that you see all the time and, you know, know exactly that you're in your community. It's a little bit different here. Yeah. Um, it's not uh, nearly as visible. It's something where you actually kind of have to have more of a network of people to figure out yeah. where you guys are. It's, it's a little bit harder. Um, and I think it kind of adds to making it a, it a little bit more um, difficult, I guess, being out here because where I'm, where I'm from and where, you know, a lot of us coming from like, you know, the Southwest or, you know, the Pacific North, Northwest or the Midwest, um, we're used to a really strong community. And here, I think the community is much, much smaller. And, you know, East, East Coast tribes are, are, are different, different situation. <laughs> you guys are in such a different situation than we are. Um, but, you know, Creating those, creating those relationships and all of that is, is, is incredibly important, so. Well, I would say that our people have had a different history and that we didn't come to Washington to negotiate, and that's because the only treaty I'm aware of that we were involved with predates the establishment of the United States. Mm -hmm. And by the time uh, other tribes were coming to negotiate, our tribe was just kind of hanging out in the mountains trying to stay alive. Um, but it was very interesting to me because when the National Museum of the American Indian opened, so many Native people came to take part in those events, and our people were among them. So they got to march in the parade with all of the other Indian nations and to feel this incredible validation and pride. And I said, it's the only time I ever felt really comfortable in Washington, D.C., because there were so many Indian people around us. So we have... Um, initiated more of a dialogue with other tribes and in so doing um, also initiated dialogues with political organizations and have come here many, many times uh, on behalf of our federal recognition bill, which is still in Congress. So. Um, yeah, it makes me think of um, kind of in a similar situation with Karen where we're not federally recognized, but still um, I do know of some trips that here to D.C. and um, speeches that were given here in D.C. And also um, a major issue that we've had in Virginia is the Racial Integrity Act. Um, you know, that's basically, it's a, you know, a paper genocide where, you know, we were not allowed to check that box of being Native American. And I know a lot of Virginia Native people actually came here to D.C. to get married um, just to be able to, you know, check that box to say, um, you know, on their marriage certificate that they are um, Native American. So that's uh, uh, definitely a big issue that still is having an impact today for Virginia Native people. And also being here, working here in D.C., it is, you know, always an interesting um, dynamic. Um, being at the museum, there's a lot of Native visitors um, that we're able to see, or even just somewhere around in the city or suburbs, you know, a lot of times we'll, you know, might see Native people and just kind of like, hey, where are you from? <laughs> so, um, you know, and help, you know, people 
um, sometimes feel feel more comfortable. You know, people that are maybe just coming here or just here for a short um, business trip or um, you know for whatever reason. Um, so it's always an uh, interesting dynamic as well. So. Yeah, I just did want to follow up on that. I yeah. mean, that's so. This is a very. I kind of mentioned at the at the end, and and you guys were talking about this. Very distinctive to this area. Sorry, very distinctive to this area um, on the Atlantic Seaboard, Chesapeake in particular, is the um, documentary erasure of Native people um, on the records. So sometimes you'll see people listed as Indians in the church on church records or in other kinds of ethnographical records, but on census um, being noted, you know, free people of color, sometimes from one census to the next, um, or if a reservation was dissolved, um, once the reservations were dissolved, um, either legally or generally illegally, you see the change of designation from Indian to free people of color, free color, free Negro. Um, and then, of course, like you were saying in Virginia, uh, the category of Indian was outlawed. It was, prohib it was prohibited until Loving versus Virginia in 1967 with the Racial Integrity Act. It, it's, it's, un it's astounding. So, so those are the other things. It's like you may be looking at records that are Indian records, but they don't appear that way because you have to make a leap back um, to an earlier document to then trace it back forward. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's tricky. We do have time for a question or two from the audience uh, if uh, anyone would like to ask questions of our panelists. Could you explain what you meant by racial genocide? I mean, uh, paper genocide? So the question is, can you explain what you meant by paper genocide? Uh, yeah, go, go Karen, yeah. Okay. We'll just rush the mic. <laughs> um, well, we, we refer to a specific instance where a guy named Dr. Walter Plecker and some of his colleagues uh, managed to lobby for the passage of the Racial Integrity Act in 1924, which made it a felony for a person of color to marry a person that was considered white. And Plecker mounted a campaign against Native people in particular, correcting, he thought, their birth certificates so that they did not say Indian. And so he changed their identification racially to colored or free issue or a number of different terms that had popularity over the four decades that he was in power, which effectively erased the native people of the region. So when we say paper genocide or documentary genocide, he wiped out whole groups of people uh, in, in policy and on paper, where they continued to exist, but not with the identification that they had for themselves. Yeah, and I just, uh, there's one other, to me, there's one other piece of paper genocide um, that is still very much an issue today, which is the issue of blood quantum. Mm -hmm. um, so when you meet a lot of people and they ask you, you know, what are you? After I tell them I'm a person, I explain, yes, I'm Native American. <laughs> um, and oftentimes people will just say, how much? Um, which people don't understand, that's incredibly offensive, right? I'm fully Native American, I'm 100% a citizen of my nation. Um, but that mentality comes from the policy of blood quantum. And so it has, you know, there was a, there was a very, very set idea to bleed Indians out, right? Um, that was kind of like the federal government's intent was, let's say that you're not Indian unless you're this much blood, because we're gonna decide just randomly, you're 100%, like, so for instance, my own family, um, we have members that are the same generation, but somehow they all have different blood quantums because of how dark they were. I mean, that is a really common thing. So it's those kind of politics, once you're down to that, you know, quarter or eighth or whatever it happens to be, then you're not Indian anymore. And to me, that's absolutely paper genocide, and it's something that a lot of our nations are struggling with. Um, my own, we don't have blood quantum, but we still have that little blood quantum on our, on our cards. Still to remind you that you're only this much Indian. Um, and it's, it's become a really serious issue as, as far as maintaining the, the memberships that we have. I mean, many nations are very small. And if you can't marry outside your own nation or, you know, if you have to meet a certain amount of whatever the federal government said all those generations ago, it, it becomes a real significant problem of survival. 
I see one more question over here. Uh, hey, uh, I've gotten my cell phone to speak Salish. <laughs> <laughs> and if we're looking to the future and preserving the tradition, I wonder, could any of you share your experiences with language revitalization? Mm, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Please. Uh, yes, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, there's some uh, work being done um, you know, just recently with our Pamunkey language, um, which is very similar to Piscataway, and um, I could hear when she was saying some of the words, um, you know, how similar they are. Um, so, so yeah, there's some work. There's an, it's not, um, you know, fluently spoken by anyone um, now. But um, you know, with this work, there have been some classes recently uh, on the reservation as well. Um, so there's a uh, little work being done on that. And also in my house uh, with my wife. <laughs> uh, my wife also is, uh, is Polynesian, so um, sometimes she'll get out some things and we'll start um, practicing and um, teaching our son as well. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's going on. I would encourage you to download the, the Nietzsche app also. <laughs> um, that's an Anishinaabe uh, application to, you know, have basically a pocket dictionary. Um, so there are, language revitalization is very serious, you know, across the board. Every nation is fully aware of it. Um, there are a lot of congressional members and currently we have, you know, Senator Tester is actually really supportive of, of uh, dedicating funding to immersion schools. Um, to including Native American curriculum, uh, you know, in public schools for, there are Native Americans going to public schools, there's lots of us. Um, most of us go to public schools, I did. Um, and y there's actually, if you, if you also want to look, there's an Ojibwe online dictionary. Um, there are, the efforts to preserve the languages that are still here, we do, we are fortunate to have lots of fluent speakers. It's always so sad when you hear about people that don't have fluent speakers left. Um, but language revitalization is absolutely happening. And I, I think, you know, Hawaii is a really great example of seeing incredible success by, you know, a combination of immersion schools and developing these modern applications to get children speaking the language again and get their parents speaking the language with them. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you for that question. I think saving our languages is so important because the way that we think is embodied in the way that we talk, you know, and how, how we translate the world through the words that we use. Um, so it, it's really essential that we retain our languages if we still have them, or try to bring them back if we don't. Um, in the case of my people, the Monacan people, our language, uh, the closest rela related language is called Tudelo, and it was actually documented in Canada after some of our people went there and affiliated themselves with the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois people. Um, and it was documented there. So my PhD is actually in linguistic anthropology, and that's the language that I'm working with, trying to ascertain what is most important to my people about bringing that la language back so that once we begin a language revitalization program, we'll be able to target the areas they most want to learn about um, effectively. And what we've learned is that they really want to be able to pray because they feel like um, that is their natural language that corresponds to our homeland geography and to the ancestors that have died there. And when we do our reburial ceremonies, which we've done four of them, they want to be able to talk to the ancestors in the words that they would recognize. In a moment, I'm going to ask John to come up and say a few words. Um, but uh, I, I'd like you to join me in, in thanking these amazing panelists. I, I'm so astounded by, by these folks. So thank you very much. And then we'll go ahead and step down off the podium and ask John to come up and say a few words before we break. Thank you. I'm uh, John Van Aldenhoren, the uh, Director of Scholarly and Educational uh, Programs at the, uh, uh, at the Library of Congress, uh, and I'm here to represent the Kluge Center. The mission of the Kluge Center 
uh, in case somebody didn't say it before, is to bring together scholars and researchers from around the world to stimulate and energize one another, to distill wisdom from the library's rich resources, and to interact with policymakers and the public. And I think what we've seen here today is just a great example of that actually happening uh, with a researcher and, and people coming in from outside. Uh, Eric asked me to, um, to, make, uh, to uh, make an announcement about the program. At 2 o'clock, uh, we continue with uh, uh, a program sponsored or, or run by the Law Library on the Indigenous Tribal Law Portal. I know they've put a lot of work into this, so you'll want to you'll see this. And then at 3 o'clock, there's a tour of the Great Hall, uh, and, um, and then you go up to the Rare Books Reading Room, where I'm sure they'll have some, some interesting things to see uh, relating to the topic. So, Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for your for your forbearance with my <laughs> my situation. Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to the Library of Congress as we celebrate Native American Heritage Month. And thank you all for coming. My name is Carrie Newton Lyons. I am a research manager and legislative attorney in the administrative law section of the American Law Division of Congressional Research Service here at the library. I'm also a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma and a member of the library's group of Native American employees and colleagues. And I would like to first thank, send a thanks to those folks who have uh, from the group today for shepherding the program and the events and making them happen. So thank you and thank you. Uh, as you know, this program will be highlighting the library's indigenous tribal law portal. But before the demonstration begins, I want to take a few moments to make some brief comments about the importance of this project, especially in light of Native American Heritage Month. It's probably obvious that the Indigenous Law Portal will provide a valuable resource and tool for analysts and academics, practitioners and students of both federal Indian law and federal Indian policy, as well as tribal law and policy. But, well, and as an attorney who has worked in the field of federal Indian law for quite some time, I can speak directly to the value of the portal as a resource that will provide access to an array of tribal laws and documents that are necessary for that work. But I also want to highlight and speak more about the value of the portal outside of the practice of law and outside of scholarship on tribal law and policy since the portal will provide an outstanding vehicle for generally educating people about Indian tribes and Native Americans. As many of you may know, Native Americans and Indian tribes are often viewed as historical entities, part of American history that is taught in schools as relics of the past, such as sharing food with the pilgrims at Thanksgiving. But people are not often taught that Indian tribes continue to exist as sovereign nations with governments and judicial systems that create, enforce, and adjudicate their laws within the nations. This portal, however, will provide a tool for educating people about Indian tribes as they currently exist and as they currently operate. This portal will show that tribes have constitutions and laws that are created and amended as the tribes continue to develop and deal with modern day issues. This portal will also show that tribes have legislative branches that enact ordinances, regulations, and laws, and executive branches that enforce the laws, and judicial branches that interpret the laws and make decisions that set precedents for the tribes. This portal will allow people to access not only documents relating to Indian land sessions in the 1700s and 1800s, but also to the 2013 amended constitution of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma, demonstrating that Indian tribes are not historical entities locked in the past, but vibrant and current self-governing nations that importantly contribute to American society. So again, thank you on behalf of the library's Native American employees and colleagues, and I hope that you enjoy the program today. Let me add my welcome uh, to Carrie's welcome. My name is Roberta Schaefer, and I have the pleasure of serving currently as the acting law librarian. Um, we didn't confer on our notes, but we should have, because basically my prepared remarks <laughs> track Carrie's almost to a T. Um, and therefore, it shows, well, I'm going to say not so much great minds. This is, not, this is so obvious and so important that you don't have, a great have to have a great mind to see that this project is truly uh, breaking new ground 
for the Library of Congress and serves so many purposes, not the least of which is the proof of concept that Native American tribes are alive and well and organic legal systems, just like any other legal jurisdiction in the world today. But the beauty of the portal uh, is really multifaceted. First and foremost, I want to say that for the Library of Congress, it represents a sea change in the way that we look at the entire classification um, concept. And so um, for that alone, I applaud the, the woman who has really borne all of the bricks and mortar for that, and that is Dr. Yolanda Goldberg, who is sitting in the audience. I don't know if you can pan her, but let us all just flatter her with some applause. She, with the permission of Beecher Wiggins, the head of um, one of the major sections of library services, conceived of this ideology, this concept of moving from a historical approach to a uh, geopolitical approach to organizing the information, and then going that next step of linking to um, external websites and sources so that a person can really almost do a one-stop shop by, believe it or not, using a classification system. And so today, we are really marking the moment in which the idea uh, of the word classification system to describe access to information goes out the window. And we now finally can say that classification is a roadmap, is a guide, is a handbook for knowledge. And so I applaud Yolanda uh, and Tina Gein, who worked with her from the Law Library originally, and now the two uh, people who will be uh, actually demonstrating the portal for you um, from the library staff. Um, and that is Robert Bramer. And I'm just looking down at my paper because I don't want to get his title wrong. And so he is Senior Legal Reference Specialist. And uh, Jennifer Gonzalez, who is the, um, in, an information analyst in the library. The final thing that I do want to say also about the value of this portal is that it enables one of the greatest um, assets of the Library of Congress as a clearinghouse of knowledge, and that is that not only does one now have access to the Seminole uh, 2013 constitutional um, amendments, but there is an opportunity to now compare among and between the documents of indigenous peoples and other sovereign nations all over the world. And this is a truly important thing in today's times where no legal system exists as an island. And all legal systems and all peoples of the world want to compare and contrast their cultures, their commercial way of life, their community habits, their, um, their, their civilizations to those of the past, of the present, and by way of these portals to the future. So thank you for stepping into the future with us, Dr. Yolanda Goldberg, and the rest of you who are here this afternoon. And without further ado, Robert and Jennifer. Okay, let me bring up the site. Okay, let me start by saying researching indigenous law can be very difficult. Often the only source of the materials, current materials, is the tribes themselves. And if you're looking for historical materials, they're often spread around many different sites. So to approach this challenge, the indigenous law portal is organized around Dr. Goldberg's K classification system. Providing a portal that combines the Library of Congress's vast historical resources with uh, particularly historic constitutions, charters, and codes with links to current sources of law from the tribes themselves. Uh, that said, I want to mention what the, tribe, the portal does not do is identify every single law that's applicable to a given tribe. That's beyond the scope of the project. The indigenous law portal is integrated into law.gov, the Law Library of Congress site. And uh, it initially focused on the United States We've branched out to Canada and Mexico. And in the future, it will incorporate laws and regulations affecting 
Native Americans, particularly treaties and acts from the U.S. statutes at large. Uh, <clears throat> the metadata provided in the portal is very detailed, built around Dr. Uh, Goldberg's classification schedule. And I want to go ahead and illustrate that by clicking on Canada. And going to Ontario. And now I'm going to bring up the source of the page. So I'm scrolling down to illustrate this. So here you have the name of a tribe, and then you have the div ID, which provides the classification for the tribe sourced from Dr. Goldberg's work. So that's how embedded the, uh, the metadata is, the classification schedule into the metadata of the site. Sorry, just going back here. Okay, so let's talk about how you use the portal. Um, first, you choose a country. I'm not sure why I'm not getting a map loading here. Apologize for that. We've got these great clickable maps that were provided by David Neal that allow you to just click on a, a state and go directly to that state's materials. Um, and the tribes represented within the boundaries of that state. So at the top, we've got general resources for indigenous legal materials. And if you scroll down, those resources include gateways, directories, uh, research guides, topic-specific resources, such as here you see like economic law. Uh, you've also got links to NGOs, IGOs, uh, and indigenous organizations. Uh, below that, you've got a link to Dr. Goldberg's classification schedule. And the table of contents for this is actually clickable. So you can choose a location that you're interested in and then see the classifications associated with that location. Below that, you have a link to the digitized historical constitutions as a separate collection. Um, these are also represented throughout the site um, with the tribe they're associated with. And then below that, you have uh, links to tribes. You can browse tribes by region, state, and also an alphabetical listing. So I'm going to go ahead and go to state. and choose Oklahoma to illustrate some of the resources that we have in the site. I'm going to choose the Cherokee Nation and I'm going to choose the Constitution and Laws of the Cherokee Nation from 1875. So this is an example of one of the historical resources from the Library of Congress that has been digitized. I find this one particularly interesting because it's actually written in Cherokee. There we go. I, w I wanna mention that not everything on the site is written in the, uh, you know, a tribe's language. So there's a lot of resources that even if you can't read the language that you can certainly make use of, but I just found this particularly interesting as an example of one of the historical resources on the site. Okay, next I'm going to go to Washington. And I'm going to choose the Macaw tribe. Okay. 
And this is just an example of uh, how we link to current uh, sources of uh, a tribe's law by linking directly to their website. And also below that, you see the McCall Law and Order Code. This is actually hosted by one of the partners that we link to to flesh out the site, the National Indian Law Library. Now I'm going to Alaska, and specifically the Twin Hills Village. And this is just another example of how when we're looking for current sources of law, we link directly to the tribes themselves, making these sites easy to find by organizing them into the portal. So I want to mention that uh, this product is a collaboration both within and outside of the, wall, uh, the Library of Congress. Uh, of course, Dr. Goldberg's great work on the K classification schedule, the Wall Library, our fantastic interns, um, David Neal's great clickable maps, the Geography and Maps Division, uh, and partners outside of the uh, library, the National Indian Wall Library, the Wall Library Microform Consortium, all were essential to the success of this project. Uh, we encourage feedback from all of our stakeholders, and we've already incorporated feedback that we've received into the site. Hawaii, Central, and South America are our next projects for inclusion into the portal. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer, who's going to talk about Wadat.gov's resources for American Indian legal materials. And Wadat.gov is the Law Library of Congress site. Out front, if you have not received it, we have a little handout that has all of the URLs that we've been talking about today, including the Indigenous Law Portal URL, which happens to be quite long because we want we had to fit it into the website. So what I wanted to do was to start off by showing you an easy way to get to the Indigenous Law Portal. The easiest way is to type in law.gov. And that will bring you to the Law Library's homepage. Scrolling down slightly, you'll see this Guide to Law Online with the Law Square. Indigenous, right here is in purple. That will bring you directly to the Indigenous Law Guide. This is the easiest way to get there instead of typing in that long, this long URL that you see up here. The Law Library's website also has several other resources. Some of these resources we are trying to include and some of them are proving a little difficult, so we're, we're working on them, but we want to be able to show you all of the resources that the Law Library of Congress and the Library of Congress has available for indigenous legal materials. So headed back to the homepage, we have law.gov, and scrolling down, I had said that under this Guide to Law Online is where the Indigenous Law Portal is housed. The Guide to Law Online also has many other materials that could be helpful. If we click on nations, you'll see that every nation in the world is represented here. This is a great place to start for any sort of um, research on, an act, on any other nation. Um, and U.S. Federal is specifically where we have the other American Indian material that has not been incorporated. If I scroll down, you'll see that we have an Indians of North America guide. And this is for U.S. federal law that has, in, the indigenous law guide is for indigenous legal materials, legal materials that are native to those indigenous nations. But the U.S. has also created lots of legal material in regards to our um, uh, in regards to the Native American populations that live within the geographic borders. And so that's what this material here is for. We have text, commentary, different links to different agencies, and again, another guide to the Indigenous Law Portal. We are hoping to include many of this material into the portal soon, 
but for now this is where it's housed in in sort of the same the same area headed back to law.gov again to the home page and scrolling down below the guide to law online is our section of legal reports the law library writes reports for primarily for Congress and if I go to the comprehensive index we can see that some of the reports that they've written are actually on indigenous material. These are the four reports so far that we have on our website about indigenous material. This one in particular is quite interesting. It's the preservation of historical cemeteries and it includes some information on the United States. So clicking on the name of the report brought us here to the report page. And then in this table of contents box, clicking on the United States brings up some of the report, the, the United States portion of the report that was written discussing the preservation of historical cemeteries in the US. Okay, scrolling back to the top and headed back to law.gov. Also from our homepage, if we click on research and reports, I'm gonna head a little bit farther deeper into, the, into our website so that you can see some more materials that might, may be hidden in there. The first one here, again, we clicked on research and reports, I have commemorative observances. This is a collection of materials that is all about just a, different commemorative observances that we have in the US one of them being the American Indian Heritage Month. Month. We have an overview of the month, legislative branch, executive branch documents, and web resources, specifically on, again, the Native American Heritage Month. These proclamations will bring you to a PDF. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> okay, a PDF that ex that is from the, the proclamation from the president about the National American Indian Heritage Month in the year 2007. So while the portal is a one-stop shop, oops, excuse me. Well, the portal is a one-stop shop for all indigenous legal materials. Again, this is another place where we have materials that don't exactly fit into the confines of the portal that we wanted to show. Okay, law.gov again, research and reports. And then here we have some digitized material. This first link, American Indian Constitutions and Legal Materials, is where all of those links that Robert was showing you before from the portal, where they live. Again, we have a clickable map for the different regions. And this is the South. Uh, this is our earliest material, and it starts with 1810 in the Cherokee Nation. This is also the place where you can find the material that's in the vernacular of the language, the vernacular, excuse me, the language of the tribe, or the vernacular of the tribe. Um, and we have that noted here by saying um, in Cherokee, if that's, or um, we have several different ones. There's one in Choctaw. And so you can download this PDF. and quickly view, there you go, and quickly view the document. Okay, I'll go back to the south and scroll down to where we were. Our historical materials continue on through the 1950s, 1960s, with these constitutions and corporate charters. The, these two materials happen to be in several different places on the internet, but these have been, these are PDFs that you, that we've digitized from the Library of Congress's collection. Here. 
There are also some gems in here for these older materials. Um, revised leasing. I'm going to search for this one. We have some ordinances that I have found extremely interesting and f continue to find interesting as I keep going through. This is ordinances of this town. And oh, we can just look at the some of the different titles here. You have an ordinance about dead animals. Um, yep. <laughs> Many different ones. Um, in regard to dogs, taxes. Oh, I haven't found my favorite one is up here. Where is it? Oh, no. There we go. This is one of my favorite ones. Bean shooting, nest robbing, fire cracking for boys. Only. <laughs> they were not concerned about girls, it seems. <laughs> and no destroying bird nests. <laughs> so this is one of my favorite documents that we have. I wanted to make sure I showed you. Okay, now back from the to research and reports and digitized material. I'm going to continue going through. We have some collections from the Law Library of Congress here, um, but we also have statutes at large and United States treaties. These are two that were two um, collections that we're working on increasing what we have available currently. But here in the statutes at large, you are able to access all of the statutes, all of the historical statutes at large from 1776 through 1950. Some of them are available by chapter, which means that you'll be able to look at each of the individual titles and control F to find those titles a lot quicker. Um, I'm going to go to Congress 21, and you'll, you can see that each of these titles are here with an individual PDF. So up here at the top, you could download the full Congress, or you can download the small PDFs here that would just get you the chapter or the law that you're really looking for. I'm going to scroll down to chapter 148 to give an example of one of the Indian laws that we have. This is an act to provide for the exchange of lands with the Indians residing in any of the states or territories and for the removal west of the Mississippi. This is the Indian Removal Act. That uh, They didn't call it that then, but this, is, this was the actual title for that. And so by clicking on this PDF, you would be able to open up and directly read that statute, starting here. Sorry, I'm going back to the statute. I forgot to show that each of these statutes, the advantage of breaking up each of these statutes by title means that we are able to individually put metadata into each of these statutes so that they're available to be, um, so that they're available to be searched, exactly. So for instance, this statute about the Indian Removal Act has had all of these terms here applied to it. So the search on the library's main page, putting in any of these terms will get you straight to this act. Okay, and I also mentioned treaties. These are the treaties that the United States has signed with other nations. It does not include, this treaty series so far does not include any of the treaties that the United States has signed with American Indian nations. Those were in a separate volume of statutes at large that we are currently working on very quickly, very hard to get up as quickly as possible. But we have these treaties currently, which will show some international treaties that have happened um, that have to do with Indian, um, American Indians or native peoples of anywhere. So typing in Indian brings us a search to this inter-American 
Inter-American Indian Institute. And clicking on this PDF will show that this is a, something that's been signed in 1940, and it was trying to create an Inter-American Indian Institute. Okay, there's one more um, historical source that I wanted to mention. Let's close out some of these tabs. And I'm going to go back to law.gov and click on Find Legal Resources. Legislative Resources. Again, this link is quite long, but the URL is in your handout. And Century of Lawmaking is here. This is still a Library of Congress website, and it has the first 100 years of legal documents here. So many different things, bills, statutes at large, journals. I'm going to click here to the Annals of Congress. This is the what was the historic, well, what is the current congressional record, or a precursor to the, the current congressional record, which means all the things that Congress has said or went on in that day. And if I browse the page headings and go to I and scroll down a little, we have, these are all of the different topics of what Congress spoke about in regards to Indians in, during this time. So, for example, I will click on Indian fur trade in the Senate. They've spoken about this five times, and so clicking on one of these will bring you directly to the page that they talked about the Indian fur trade. So that's it for historical documents that we have from the Library of Congress, and now we have some current documents. And I have that, that we're going to go to congress.gov. This is available in, mul oh, magic. This is available in multiple places on our website, but typing in congress.gov works just as well, and brings you here to this main page. The easiest way to get to the indigenous materials that we have here is to click on Browse, and scroll to this where it says bills by subject and policy area and policy areas Cong each of the bills that congress puts out has one subject one policy area that's attached to it and here we have native americans which is one of the f they only have a few subjects here to choose from but Native Americans has 97 bills so far with this current Congress. Clicking on Native Americans get you, gets you those 97 bills. As you can see, several are, have not gotten too far. They're just introduced here. Using these facets on the left-hand side, you're able to navigate and see exactly what it is that you're looking for. So you have bills or resolutions. Let's say I only want bills. It will redo the search and only give me those 93 bills that are bills and take out the resolutions. I can narrow this down and only look at the th three that became law. And then we have other facets here so that you can narrow down what the bills are by sponsor, committee, chamber, party. So I have the three bills that have passed but if you wanted to look at and expand the search, you could come here to the Congress, and currently we have the 114th Congress checked, which is our current Congress, but by showing more, you can look at all of the bills, or in this case the laws, since they've passed and become law, that were passed by Congress in each of the different congressional years. So again, law.gov will get you here to this portal. That's the quickest link. Let's see if that map is working. 
Nope. Not yet. But the Canada one is. So you can see there that each of the, we have the regions here in a certain color, and then each of the different uh, territories or provinces are highlighted there, so you can go through. So we welcome any questions that you have, any questions today that you have, or if you have any help that you could give us on the portal, any suggestions that you have, we would absolutely welcome it. So thank you. Any questions? I'll ask a question. Yes. So obviously since the documents are contemporary, um, what kind of like relationships do you have with the tribes to make sure that the you know contemporary documents keep coming in so that you can you know maintain a current database or as current as possible? Right. We are doing as much outreach as we can to try and speak with the tribes, to let them know about the portal and all of the availability that we have. I think the first step is really making sure that people know about the portal and know that it's out there. And once people start to recognize that it's there, then, then hopefully those relationships will really start to be developed. Yes. I think I will open that up to anyone else. <laughs> no, that's quite all right. <laughs> Does <laughs> Fantastic. Any more questions? I can't see. Great. Thank you. We'll make sure that you get a, a handout when you leave so that you have all those URLs or now you know how to find them. <laughs> Thank you. Right. <laughs> it will take you really long when you turn it into seven, you know, six letters or something. I think typically we use USA.gov as a link shortener. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that's usually the standard standard process that they allow for shortening links. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Robert and Jennifer, for an outstanding program. It was really, really good. Um, before everyone departs, I just want to hand out a couple of other thank yous as well. 
First, I want to thank Eric Eldridge here. Um, Eric, yes. <laughs> Eric was, was instrumental in putting this, this uh, full day seminar together, getting the panels together, getting the programs together, getting the displays that were out here earlier today together as well. Um, did a fantastic job. And thank you so much for putting this together for us this, this, today, this morning and this afternoon. So thanks, Eric. It was a team effort. <laughs> And of course, I want to thank everyone here who attended today's seminar. We really appreciate your support of um, American Indian libraries and connecting them to federal libraries, connecting them to the federal government in general, and getting, getting the word out there that, um, that American Indian libraries and American, Indian, American Indians in general are important parts of American cultural history, American history in general, and we need to continue to support them and work with them um, to, to find, to get the resources and services that they, that they deserve to have. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.